Greetings ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Library of the Unwritten. I am the Archiver. Back with today's stories. Today's series is the final part of what Deku became a spy for Yue. Before we start, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more content like this. Now let's get into it. It was now closing in on the second month since Izuku Midoriya had made his report about the coming war. During that time he had made a total of six communications, but on the last one, he said he would be going silent, as he would be dedicating himself to training, and would only reach out if he learned of anything that could change the outcome of the war. As such, it had been about two weeks since then when they received the last communication, as Nezu knew it was the best move, since more communications would indeed risk Izuku's position, since he didn't need to do it for money, since the Paranormal Liberation Front was bringing money in via the businesses that were connected to it. However, that didn't mean that the hero's side stopped working hard for the coming war. The commission had brought the detective in to question all of the staff involved in the case in the upper management of the commission and the prime minister's office to clear everyone before they started to get work on gathering heroes. The detective was confused at first until he was read in on everything that was going on, but he still did not learn of the truth regarding Izuku Midoriya, as no one, except those initially involved in Izuku's case, knew the truth as it would be kept that away as long as they could. The heroes did have a list of known PFL members that Izuku was able to slip into his analysis by providing their ranks instead of names and other information. This was also a part of one of the last messages that Izuku had ever sent to them as well, but it was still a large amount of information that they were thankful for, since it made clearing out the heroes much easier to do as they needed to prepare their war force. This was how all of the main heroes of the attack force were gathered in a briefing room together, where the detective was reading everyone into the current mission. As it stood, they were able to gather their forces, and would be launching the assault soon within the next few weeks, which would be about the middle of the third month stage for the procedure that Shigaraki was going under. They hoped interrupting it would prevent him from gaining the power or at least only partial power. As everyone sat around the table which did include Nezu since he was a part of the planning for the war, the heroes and some police were told what was going on with the targets they would be going after. As it stands, the commission has been gathering a large number of heroes for a war that they have discovered that will start soon. They're hoping to attack first to have the upper hand, but we still will be fighting an uphill battle. The enemy is the Paranormal Liberation Front, which is a merged group of the League of Villains, and a return of the Meta Liberation Army. As it stands from what the commission had gathered, they believe the forces amount to over 116,000 individuals, though we will be attacking the main base and the lab that Shigaraki is held in undergoing an experiment to gain more power. The detective said and some asked how the commission found this information out, but the detective shook his head. He explained that he was not informed of how they obtained the information, as they have been using him mainly to clear who was a PFL member or not. As it stands you are not allowed to talk to those that are not on the approved list, as they may be a PFL member, or haven't been cleared by being questioned like all of you have been. The detective said and that earned nods of heads from everyone. The detective explained that they were evacuating cities already by the commission, faking a chemical attack by a villain on the cities between the mountain villa and the hospital. Some asked if that would not alert the PFL which Nezu spoke up at. We planned it quite well as we are going to have it covered by the media as it happens, so the PFL will learn about the attack as heroes will chance the staged villain down. It will be staged as a group that aims to cleanse the earth of people with mutations, which several of the cities in the path have a larger population of set quirks. Nezu explained as he said the attacks would happen on the same day, so as not to arouse suspicion, and nothing will be prepared in advance, so it looks like a real rush to secure the citizens and move them away from the chemical attack. The citizens would then be moved to a few cities over where they knew it had enough places to hold the people long enough. Soon the topic came to that anyone with a provisional license would also be pulled to help evacuate the cities for the most part, with some being on the front lines to help counter some quirks of known PFL members that they found out about. Otherwise, the students would all be on the back lines, while the pro-heroes would take the front stage in the war. Some wanted to reject the reason, but Nezu reminded them that if they pull too many pro-heroes from other places, then there wouldn't be enough to keep crime and problems from arising in other cities behind their backs, which shut them all up. They realized they needed to have the numbers to fight in this battle, and it was a scary fact. After the meeting came to an end, everyone returned to go back to normal business, and to prepare for the coming battle in a few weeks, as the detective would keep clearing more heroes and others for the coming battle. While this happened, Nezu returned to UA with the racer head, which the ride back to the school was silent until about halfway there when a racer head spoke up. I need to know the truth before this war starts, a racer head said as he broke the silence. 
Nezu raised an eyebrow without turning to face the man as he asked what he was talking about, though he knew the truth. Eraserhead was asking about Izuku Midoriya, and Nezu knew that. I am talking about the interrogation of Izuku Midoriya. I am talking about how it seems full of bullshit that you and Gran Torino keep pulling, as he avoids getting into conversations with anyone outside of really you. I need to know before I go into this war my class needs to know. Eraserhead asked as he glared at the principal without turning on his quirk. Nezu turned to shout as Awa and looked at him in the eyes without missing a beat as he spoke. Class 1A and 1B will be offered an exemption from being pulled into the war, due to their former relation to Izuku Midoriya, as it's unknown what information he gave to the PFL about his former classmates, nor do we know where he will be at on the battlefield once it starts. I sadly cannot offer that to any of my staff, since you are all pro heroes already, but since they are students the commission agreed to offer it. Make sure they understand that there is a high risk of death in this war, and they wouldn't be judged for taking the exemption offered, due to their former connection to the S-rank villain Izuku Midoriya Aka accused. Nezu said as he turned away from Eraserhead who eyes widened at the statement as the commission had not released what his villain rank was, and the fact that such an offer was being offered. It meant either Nezu really wanted to protect his students, so they can avoid the war, or Izuku Midoriya truly did turn on them, but something kept nagging as Izawa since the statement from Nezu was not a true answer, and Izawa knew that. This was how Izawa found himself standing in front of 1A and 1B, as he informed them of the coming war that they would be helping in. The students were freaked out, but Izawa had one more thing to say. The commission has agreed to offer these two classes an exemption if you desire to take it, due to your former relations with the S-rank villain accused Aka Izuku Midoriya. It's unknown what information he provided the PFL about you all or where he will be on the battlefield, so they can't place you away from him. There's a risk of you facing him in this war, meaning you would need to fight him. I want you all to think about it. As all was said to both classes who were shocked. None of them said anything until Bakugo spoke up saying that he won't back away when he has a chance of finding Deku to smack some sense into him. Soon others spoke up and agreed which caused Azawa to hide a smile behind his scarf. Azawa asked if there was anyone that wanted to take the offer, but no one did which he nodded his head at. Okay then, everyone needs to get in their gym uniforms and meet me at ground beta for some emergency training. A lot of you will be on evacuation duty, but some may be closer to the front lines. I want to drill you in your actions on rescue work, since this war will get destructive, and we don't know if we can get everyone cleared away from the city that a portion of the fight will happen in. As all was said and they all ran to go get changed as Azawa made his way out to the field. Nezu though smiled behind his teacup as he drank tea, and watched the two classes agree to still go to the war, in hopes of finding one Izuku Midoriya. So many sunsets and sunrises have passed my dear student, only so few remain before we arrive at the crossroads of your life. I never believed in a god, but if there truly is one then I hope they will bless you to have enough fortune to come out of all of this. Nezu thought as he sat his cup down and looked at a photo of one Izuku Midoriya. It was a photo of Nezu, Gran Torino, and Izuku which Nezu had gotten off the security cameras before everything happened. While all of this happened, Izuku had finished his daily training as twice, and Toga comes up to him in the mountains. Hey Izu Toga called out, and Izuku chuckled. Yes. Izuku asked as he wiped the sweat off his head. We brought you some drinks since we saw you were done. Twice said as he brought out different drinks but kept changing them from different hands as he kept recommending each one and then changing his mind. Izuku thanked them and stretched his muscles a bit as Toga asked for some blood as she tried to stab him to get a bit since Izuku always declines. Toga, I've explained a bit on why I don't offer you my blood. I don't want a killing you which is a good chance of doing so due to your quirk abilities. Izuku said as he truly didn't want it to kill her. He knew she could use quirks of those she transforms into, which means if he did transform into Izuku, then the fact is the quirk may kill her or have side effects, since her body truly isn't as fit as Izuku's to handle the quirk. Toga pouted, but Izuku reminded her that the PFL had a lot of fresh blood bags that they had on hand, since members donated blood on a regular basis, to ensure the group had a stock outside of hospitals for the wounded. This switched her focus like it always did as she drooled a bit at the thought of all of that fresh blood she could have. They soon made their way back to the villa, as Twice asked how much control he had gained in the recent months that had passed. Izuku thought it over and told him, I pushed my limit to a little over 70% from 65%. Izuku said well he in fact actually had 75% under control, and could push it to 80% without fracturing his bones, but would start bruising it after prolonged use. Though that was without support gear as he could go to 90% with support gear, which was very important for this war. Thank god I had Redestro acquire me support gear. Izuku thought. 
through all of the stress and constant usage and fighting over the many months that he had been with the league turned PFL, Izuku had steadily increased his control of one for all, though he did wish he could control 100% without support gear, since he knew this war would be difficult if Shigaraki woke up with all for one in his body. Though unknown to Izuku or anyone on the PFL side, the war was going to start much sooner, as Izuku would not be informed of when it would start, so he would be caught off guard, just like everyone else would be, so his cover wouldn't be blown. It was finally the day for it all to happen as the pro heroes were starting the war, before the Paranormal Liberation Front could start the war themselves. There were two separate forces of the pro heroes that were attacking. One force was going towards the hospital, while the other force was going towards the mountain villa. Endeavor, a racerhead, the detective, with a handful of other people were on the journey to the hospital, while the bigger force of heroes was heading straight for the villa, since they knew that all of the commanders of the PFL were in a scheduled meeting that was taking place that day. It was why they decided to launch the assault on that day of the mall, as the group held the meeting to capture as many people as possible, before Shigaraki would wake up in another month and a half. Though there were other forces of heroes going after the other bases this meeting though was the largest with all of the enemy commanders though. As all of this happened, Nezu was in the command center that was a bit away from the battles, since he couldn't help in physical combat. The Hero Commission decided not to call Redestro for a meeting like initially planned, as Nezu had reminded them of the clones that twice could do as they had no way of ensuring it would really be the actual Redestro, and the commission would be left more or less defenseless, since all major heroes and a lot of the others were on the task forces for the war. As all of the task forces started to move around, Izuku was sitting in a meeting room with the other executives, as they were about to head down to the basement area for the large gathering meeting. Izuku felt as if something was off but couldn't place it, so he just ignored it. Hopefully, the attack will happen soon since Shigaraki will awaken in about another month and a half. Izuku thought as he stretched his muscles and stood up. It's time to go downstairs everyone, Izuku said, and they all nodded as they headed downstairs. While they moved downstairs they were unaware of what was coming as we switched to the town of Jakku, where people had started to notice the lack of pro heroes. Though there was one pro hero in the town which was slight and go who looked confused about the lack of heroes until death arms locked the man's head and slammed him into the ground so he couldn't escape, as he called him out on being a part of the liberation, shocking the liberation member. It was at that moment that heroes flooded the city as the main group with Endeavor, a racerhead, and others entered the hospital in search of the doctor and Shigaraki. Apart from the last few communications, Izuku had done a few months ago included the fact that the first doctor they find would likely be just a clone, since twice had made clones for the doctor, as the real one dedicated his time on Shigaraki. As such, they made sure to quickly move through the hospital, while the evacuation team rushed into the city to start removing all of the citizens that they could. The people in Jakku City were really the only ones in danger of being harmed, since the other cities had been mostly cleared, but there were still heroes cleaning the outskirts of those cities, since they couldn't officially clear the entire place, but only a major portion of it, due to the fake chemical attacks, which meant they could speed through it quickly. As the doctor moved down the hallway, he was whistling a tune as he thought about how close Shigaraki was to being completed when he was called out by a voice from behind him. Endeavor and they had found the doctor which Eraser had turned his quirk on right away, which showed them that the doctor indeed had a quirk not listed as he started to rapidly age. This must be how all for one lived so long an anti-aging quirk, though I wonder if this is the real doctor. Asked the detective from the side of Eraserhead. Eraserhead quickly broke the doctor's leg to see if it was indeed a clone, and it turned out it truly was a clone. Damn, keep moving. Endeavor called out as they hurried since the doctor likely found out about the clone being destroyed. The rabbit hero. Maruko, though had already sped off aiming for the morgue, since she knew the chances of the first doctor being a fake was high, so she took a lot of heroes to head off towards the underground lab. Though the doctor noticed what was going on a few moments later when he saw on the camera footage near him that heroes were heading towards him, but the rabbit hero was moving fast as she passed a lot of gnomus which she warned the others about. As the doctor was running, Maruko blasted through the walls, killing the warping gnomu with the rubble that fell. She smirked seeing the warping Nomu was down for the count which she radio in, so the others knew as the other raid would start as well right about now, which meant the doctor had no way of escaping. While the fighting in the hospital had kicked off, the heroes had arrived at the mountain villa, as the pro heroes rushed towards the building, some students that had to join the front initially were scared like crazy like Charge Bolt, who was asking why he was in the front. Though, the heroes made a dramatic entry as Cementos jumped ahead of everyone and slammed his hand on the ground, controlling all of the cement that was used in the building, as he warped it, as he strained himself to provide a large opening, so that enough heroes could get in without a bottleneck happening, which would be dangerous for their side. 
As the different divisions of the PFL moved forward to fight the pro heroes, one PFL member who was a leader of one of the teams, moved forward with his electrical quirk, as he sent out an attack he called the Supreme Discharge. Thundered it but it got blocked and absorbed, but none other than provisional hero Charge Bolt, who got encouraged to act by midnight and his classmate, as he was told to fight for those that he cared most about. This allowed all of the pro heroes to keep pushing forward without the big scale attack that got launched, and even pro hero Hawks flew in as he was given a target to hunt down. Hawks' target was none other than Twice himself, as Twice presented a huge threat to the overall battle. As such, the pro heroes sent feathers across the mansion to locate Twice as quickly as possible, and due to how many feathers he threw out, he soon found the villain and went for him. Though while all of this happened, there were squads of pro heroes going to each of the hideouts escape paths that Izuku had given to Nezu, so that they could be blocked. Izuku wasn't able to get an entire blueprint, but he did know the locations, which was the main thing the heroes needed to ensure that no one escaped unnoticed. Down in the assembly hall where Izuku was currently with Re Destro since none of the other former league members wanted to sit in the meeting, a man came in yelling Re Destro's name, as Re Destro said he could hear him. The man shouted out, heroes are coming. Our comms are all jammed and the only way out is through the mansion. The man yelled making everyone turn to him as he kept explaining that there was an army of pro heroes attacking that had them surrounded. Redestro's cork went off as he let his stress blow up as it was indeed a stressful thing to learn about. Izuku stood up quickly as he was shocked to hear about the attack. Seems they decided not to alert me which is fine with me. I wish I had more time to train, but oh well. Izuku thought as he started to consider what he should do as he didn't know anything about the hero's side plans, and was in the dark. Outside though, the villains were pushed into the mansion as heroes wiped some of them out like the ninja hero Ed shot, who poked a hole in people's lunges, which made them impossible to fight. It wouldn't kill them, but it would keep them out of the fight. Midnight then made them all sleep to ensure they didn't try anything as she waved her fans in front of them, as she moved her quirk gas around. Now while all of this went on outside, Hawks was currently detaining Twice who was being surrendered by all of the feathers from Hawks. The main objective was to arrest the man, but Hawks was clear to kill him as well. Twice though wasn't going to go down without a fight, as he refused to do anything less for the League as he saw it as his family. This caused a fight between both of them to break out, but there were other fights going on as well through the place for example with Fatgo and his helpers, who were aiming to block the last passageway that allowed people to escape out of the bunker from underground. For example, Tsukiyomi, Tokoyami from 1A, who were with Fat Gum, sent Dark Shadow down the tunnel which encounters Re Destro, who was able to block Dark Shadow at full power for a bit, before Re Destro's fake legs gave out and broke, which allowed Dark Shadow to throw the man all the way down back to the assembly hall, as well as collapse the tunnel. Dark Shadow came back though scared as he had sensed another powerful individual down in the assembly hall, who he called a real monster which was in fact Gigantomachia. Fat Gum confirmed the individual Dark Shadow was talking about, but said he shouldn't move, since the big boss was not on the field due to being asleep. That giant shouldn't move as long as the boss isn't moving around, since no one else can order him around. Fat Gum said as Tsukiyomi asked how they knew this intel which Fat Gum said he had no idea how their side found out about it. All of this fighting went on as Izuku had started to make his move upwards to get into the fighting, since he still needed to act his part. In all honesty, he hoped Gigantomachia did not wake up even though he felt like he had a good chance of waking the giant up, and ordering him around with some simple orders due to him carrying one for all, which was connected to all for one and Shigaraki, but Izuku wasn't going to test that theory right now. Izuku had seen Dobby rushing off in a direction before a large blast of fire happened, which made Izuku wonder what was going on up there, so he started to head in that direction. This was how the entire war started and only more devastation waited for everyone. As Izuku pushed forward to where Dobby had gone he was shocked to find the current number 3 pro hero Hawks fighting Dobby, but what shocked him, even more, was that Twice was badly hurt, which made Izuku feel horrible. Damn it. I hate the fact that I connect with nearly all of them due to our pasts that share common points. Izuku thought as he was meant to be a hero, but he still had grown some care towards each of them, though Izuku realized he was still playing the part of the villain, so he might as well keep it up, as his part was not meant to come to an end, until Shigaraki was detained from what he was told in the last physical meeting he had at UA. Flashback. As you are aware due to the sheer scale of the threat we can't have you pulling out unless you believe you are compromised or you believe you are in mortal danger. I'm sorry it has come to this point, but if we fail to stop Shigaraki from gaining power and defeat him in this war, then you are to continue your mission, even if it means staying with the PFL for years. We will likely never get a chance of having such a mole in such a high level position ever again. As such, even if the heroes lose you are not to break your role, so do what you must as a villain. Do you understand? 
asked the Prime Minister of Japan which Izuku nodded his head at. Izuku knew that this was a high chance the moment the league became the PFL, but hearing it was scary, since it meant he may never go home, or have the truth revealed of him still being a hero. Another agreement was made that said that Inko Midoriya living costs would be taken care of for the rest of her life in the event, Izuku Midoriya died due to his mission, or became injured past the point of continuing hero work after the mission. Izuku thanked them, but they said it was the minimum of what they could do, since he might never return from the mission for years, depending on how the war played out. Flashback over. As Twice was running on the railing area, Izuku saw Hawks going in for the killing blow which Izuku couldn't allow. Twice didn't deserve to die as he had barely done anything worthy of death in Izuku's view. As Hawks went for the killing blow, Izuku sped up quickly with Ofa, and sent out a black whip which grabbed Twice, and pulled him out of the way which caused Hawks to look towards Izuku. Izuku Midoriya, S rank villain. Hawks said as his eyes widened seeing Izuku. Dabi I got Twice, leaving it to you. Izuku said as he kept the real body of Twice in his whip and moved away. The job accused. Dabi said with a grin on his face as he and Hawks went at it again. Izuku ran with Twice and soon found Twice and Mr. Compress being detained by a pro hero, so he jumped down to them, and knocked the man again the wall which forced him to release them. He then moved behind Toga and lowered Twice down, but kept him in his hold. Twice isn't in combat shape anymore. We need to get out of here since if they know about this location, then they might have discovered the hospital which isn't surprising, since that damn lab takes a lot of energy. Izuku said as he grabbed the pro hero that he had knocked out and thrown him across the pathway, so that he hoped the hero wouldn't get killed. Even though I played the villain part I can at least try to avoid needless deaths on the hero side or those from the league. Izuku thought. While well, there he grouped, a student on the outside known as Tsukiyomi, had decided to leave the safety of Fat Gum and head back, as he believed his mentor Hawks was in danger for some reason in his gut, and he was right. Tsukiyomi arrived just in time to stop Dobby from killing Hawks at the last second, but more importantly back at the hospital, things were heating up as the heroes were pushing through closer and closer to where the doctor and Shigaraki were currently located. The rabbit hero Mirko was fighting her way through the high-end Nomus, as she was getting closer and closer to them, but she knew the high-ends had fully awakened and weren't in their sluggish states anymore. Damn it, got to do what you got to do. Mirko thought as she changed her plans and left the Nomus where they were at as she charged forward into the lab. She went deeper and deeper as she ran as fast as she could, even though the Nomu landed more blows on her. Endeavor and the others were pushing as fast as they can to come to support her. But she had finally found the tube that Shigaraki was in, and at that moment from just glancing at Shigaraki, she felt overwhelming fear due to his existence. She landed a kick on the chamber holding Shigaraki, but before she could fully complete it, the chamber only cracked slightly, releasing some of the water and pressure inside of it. The Nomu that had stopped her from fully destroying the equipment pulled her back as she was tossed out of the deepest part of the lab, where she was thrown into Endeavor, who had been closing into the lab area. Mirko who was being held by Endeavor, screamed out for them to finish it off. Shigaraki is in there. So is the old fart. We can't let him wake up. She yelled out to everyone near her. The racer had and the others kept pushing forward as they knew backup would be only a few moments away, but he knew by the tone of Mirko's voice, that those few seconds were still highly important. As such, he told X Les and Mick to run into the lab and finish it as Crust and Eraser had dealt with the Nomus. As they arrived, they could see that the doctor was preparing to wake Shigaraki up, as he pressed a button the same moment present Mick destroyed the container that held Shigaraki. As present Mick punched the doctor, x -Less checked Shigaraki and found no heartbeat, but the doctor spoke, he's in a death-like state to better withstand the process, the capsule was for facilitating the procedure while preserving and reviving him. The doctor said as he cried. In those moments more heroes arrived and started to wipe out the remaining Nomu that were in the lab, as the heroes believed they were within the grasp of victory. As present Mick grabbed the doctor and started to leave, x -Less saw a machine that was still running, but what he didn't know, was that leaving Shigaraki where he has only screwed them over. The reason for this was due to the fact that inside of Shigaraki's mind, he was currently seeing his past family who he had ended up killing, but also his grandmother. Though there was one more individual, his master all for one. Shigaraki pushed away his family as Nana Shimura asked him not to forget, and not to reject who she was, but that still left All for One in his mind. All for One called out Shigaraki to come to him which made him start walking to him, but before he fully reached the man he froze as words suddenly came to his mind. Tenko I don't understand All for One and your relationship as best as I can but be careful. Since the doctor is passing his court to you then it means that All for One has an echo inside of the quirk which will be inside of you which means he can directly influence you like the past users have been trying to do against me, since I've turned away from All Might. 
It's all about who will is stronger and more directed that determines who is in control, so don't let him just take your body. Please Tenko. Izuku asked back in the lab which made Tenko Shimura Aka Tamura Shigaraki freeze. All for one was displeased as he ordered Tamura Shigaraki to come to him again in a bit more forceful tone, but Shigaraki had another idea. As he came up to All for One he suddenly attacked the man and decayed the echo. What are you doing? All for One yelled. I won't let you take my body over you had your turn in the world now it's mine as I will choose what I do without you controlling me. Shigaraki said as he remembered Izuku Midoriya's words. The words from a person who was so similar to himself who had spoken in honestly and concern which Shigaraki hadn't had done in genuine for so long as he knew that if he gave in to his master here, then he would not be the one controlling his body anymore like Izuku had warned him about. Thank you for everything, but I will walk my own path even if it gets me killed. Shigaraki said and then suddenly in the real world, his body was shocked with electrical currents from the machine that Shigaraki had been in. The machine had been broken yes, but power was still going through it to complete the process of waking him up, and with one electrical shock, it had completed its task as Tamura Shigaraki had started to wake up. While this happened in the hospital we go back a bit in time as we go back to the situation with Hawks, as Tsukiyomi was protecting the injured hero. Dabi asked the student from Wano why he was here which he responded that he was concerned about his mentor, but Dabi only smirked as he told the boy that the pro heroes had their hands far dirtier than most villains, as he sent a blast of fire. Hawks informed his mentee that Dabi couldn't rapid fire his quirk, since it was tweaking with each attack, so he told his student to go which caused Tsukiyomi to jump over the railing, and use dark shadow to hold on, as they went down several levels before dropping down, due to the dark shadow being weakened by the flames. Though as they were escaping, Dabi tried to end it with Anter Blast as he dropped down as well, but sadly the ice user Jiten caused a large blast that got into Dabi's way of finishing it off, as Jiten freed the people that were being pushed back to allow them to have a fighting chance. Though this had given the student Fumikich Tokoyami enough time to use Dark Shadow to escape with Hawks. As this happened, many things changed due to the situation at the hospital where Shigaraki had woken up. Izuku who was currently moving with Twice, Toga, and Mr. Compress suddenly froze as they were pushing their way through some fighting. They looked at him and asked what was wrong as he shook his head and spoke, Tenko woke up. The heroes failed to stop him at the hospital, and now he woke up though incomplete I believe. It's time for us to leave and meet up with him as Gigantamachia should be ready to move now. Izuku said and they were stunned as they didn't know how he knew this. It's part of the legacy that connects me to Tenko now that he has all for one in his veins. I can somewhat sense him and he likely can sense me. Please accept that statement okay. Izuku said as he asked them to and they nodded their heads since they were just glad Shigaraki woke up. Toga did ask why Izuku kept calling Shigaraki by the name of Tenko since they didn't know his real name. Izuku explained it was his birth name which Shigaraki allows Izuku to call him by since they have a lot of common points in their past. While all of this happened and they prepared for getting a ride hopefully on Gigantamachia, down in Jakku City, the other heroes who specialized in rescue or other provisional heroes were helping as well, but they didn't know what was coming, because back in the hospital, Shigaraki raised his body and spoke, I'm cold. Shigaraki said as suddenly everything changed as Shigaraki's decay quirk launched itself across the building, destroying everything in its path. The new user of all for one had awakened from his slumber. Everything changed in only seconds as the decay was spreading, and everyone was running for their lives. Gran Torino who had been part of the raid on the hospital who came in a bit later, had grabbed present Mick and the doctor as he flew away. Izuku warned us about the decay quirk, but it seems stronger than he mentioned. Did he get other quirks outside of all for one that is boosting everything? Gran Torino thought as he flew away. As Gran Torino and everyone ran for it, a racer head was picked up by the dragon hero Ryukyu, but he was saved in the end by the crust hero who killed a Nomu that had grabbed a hold of a racer head's leg. The doctor spoke in a low tone, but it was heard clearly by present Mick and Gran Torino, you had us beat, but all your work and progress built towards this day. Now witness a miracle as Shigaraki has awakened. The doctor said as he got louder in his tone and yelled it out as the decay spread everywhere. Everyone in the town that was still getting people out, had sped it up and started to run as fast as they could as they grabbed everyone, while some tried to stop the destruction from spreading. After a bit of time, the destruction stopped, but it still leveled a large part of the city, that luckily had already been cleared out by the heroes, as the destruction stopped slightly near the range of where people were still at, but it escaped as they saw the destruction come. Now though standing in the center of it on a small hill was Shigaraki who had a piece of fabric on that had survived the destruction. Shigaraki moved over to a machine that had gotten badly damaged in the destruction which contained the replicated quirk, destroying bullets that Shigaraki had the doctor make. 
Only one had survived the destruction, so Shigaraki grabbed it and put it in his clothing in the event he needed it. As he looked around he knew the war wasn't going in their favor, but that didn't matter to him as it was time for him to get involved. He picked up a phone without turning to Kaon, since he now had control of it, and radioed to Gigantamachia, who had already stood up when he sensed his master's awaking. Come to me Gigantamachia and bring the others, Shigaraki said as he wanted the members of the league brought to him to be near his side. Now though we switch back to the mountain villa where the fighting was still going on strong. Dabi had jumped to where Izuku and the other members of the league were at. What is the situation? Dabi asked, and Izuku said Shigaraki had woken up so they needed to get to him which Gigantamachia should start moving soon. When he gets up here we will just get a ride on him to make sure we can get to Shigaraki. Don't aim to kill, but just get people out of our way since we need to move fast, and the longer we speed the longer we are away from Shigaraki since he isn't completed in the procedure, so he should be weaker than what we had planned for which will be critical for us to get there in time. Izuku said and Dabi nodded his head, and as Izuku said began to match he started to move around as a large hand blasted through the ground from the basement of the villa. As such, they had their ride, but while they had gotten their ride the hospital situation had once again turned into a battle, as the number one pro hero Endeavor, was not planning to let Shigaraki off the hook, as he came flying in, as he sued several large attacks to burn Shigaraki. Sadly, Endeavor didn't take into account that even though Shigaraki wasn't fully complete, he still had more power now than before, as he now could regenerate. This fight contained on as Endeavor pushed Shigaraki away the best he could from the citizens that were still nearby, as he asked for anyone that could fight without touching the ground to back him up. Though some like the students from one like Katsuki Bakugo and Shao Todoroki, ignored the order to leave the area, and decided to go back Endeavor up as they knew that wherever Shigaraki was that there was a chance Izuku Midoriya would be nearby as well. The others knew they didn't stand a chance currently and had to retreat, but were waiting for knowledge if Izuku Midoriya was near Shigaraki, as unknown to others the students from Wana had agreed to head to wherever Izuku Midoriya was at, if he was found on the battlefield to try and stop him themselves. Back at the fight between some of the heroes and Shigaraki, Shigaraki smiled a bit and spoke out. You really are cool Eraserhead, he said as Eraserhead had stopped him from decaying the dragon hero when he touched her, which caused him to get blasted into the air a bit. Manuel came up to Eraserhead and applied some water to his eyes which allowed Eraserhead to continue to use his quirk, which meant that they had a chance of defeating Shigaraki, which could be seen in how Endeavor had destroyed an arm of Shigaraki, but got thrown into the ground, due to the pure strength that Shigaraki had from his modified body. Shigaraki raised an arm like he was all might, and he had summoned any Nomu that had survived his decay, to start attacking the other heroes, to keep them from getting involved in the fight, so he would have better chances of winning, since he was at a bit of disadvantageous with the racer head around. This meant that he was now targeting the man himself as he charged forward with only one arm, and aimed to kill a racer head, but he was attacked by none other than Shadow Todoroki and Katuski Bakugo, who yelled out that he wasn't going to kill their teacher. But this did block Eraserhead's view for a few seconds which gave Shigaraki his other arm back due to regeneration. However, as this battle raged there was another battle going on which was away from the villa, as Gigantamachia was on the move with the league members on his back, but the heroes were still trying to prevent him from leaving. Mount Lady herself was as tall as she could go, and was trying her best to hold Gigantamachia back, but he was slowly moving forward, as he was much stronger and bigger than her, which allowed him to keep pressing forward. Though back in the rear vanguard was the other students from 1B and 1A from UA, who all had their provisional hero licenses, and one such individual was Jiro, who was monitoring the battle via the earth, where they discovered that the defense line had been breached by a large object that was heading straight for them. This worried the students about what could have gotten through the army of pro heroes, but they would still find out. As Izuku stood on the back of Gigantamachia, he saw Kamui Woods holding Midnight on his back, and knew what they were likely attempting to do which he felt scared for her as he was one of his teachers, and he didn't want her to die. They don't know we are up here yet, so when she tries to do something I will grab her with a black whip and stop her because Gigantamachia will easily kill her with one smack. Izuku thought as he didn't want his teacher to die even if he was on a mission. As Izuku was thinking, he watched as Gigantamachia threw Mount Lady out of the way since she was annoying him. As Kamui Woods and Midnight got closer, Izuku noticed Dobby was about to attack, so he attacked first. Hello SCNSCI Izuku called out which drew her attention as her eyes widened in shock, but it was too late, as Izuku grabbed them both with a black whip, and tossed them down to the ground. Stay away sensei or else you will get killed Izuku thought. Well, there she goes. I wonder how she will fare mentally having seen me. Izuku thought out loud as he smirked though inside he was sad that he had to do that to his teacher. But the past users reassured him, since they had been able to contact him a bit more, since he grew his power stronger. 
they reassured him it was better than her dying. Unaware of what Midnight was doing when she and Kamu Woods landed on the ground alive luckily due to Kamui grabbing trees, she contacted Kreidi, who was with the other students further ahead of Gigantamachi's route. She asked her if they were aware of what was going on which they confirmed they heard and could see due to Jiro and Shoji. It was at this point that Midnight warned them that they would need to try and put the monster asleep. However, I need to warn you Zuku Midoriya is on the back of the monster. I know you guys have some sort of plan to face against him, but he is strong and took us out with one attack of his black whips. Your main focus needs to be on stopping the giant before you work on Izuku Midoriya. Do you understand me? Midnight asked and Kreidi confirmed she understood as they were all determined to stop Izuku Midoriya, and if a giant had to be brought down first, they were going to do it one way or another. Midnight could no longer catch up as she and other heroes were now engaged in combat against villains that had gotten past the defense line while following the giant. Kreidi soon started to think of what to do since everyone was determined to stop Izuku, so she needed to think of a plan, and soon she did come up with one, as she had the class give her an ADA on the giants and hide estimate. They were going to trap the monster in the ground as she explained the overall plan. Though suddenly, Mount Lady grabbed onto the giant once again, which started to slow him down a bit as she tried stopping the giant, but only to be dragged along. Kreidi informed everyone that to get to Izuku Midoriya like planned, they needed to stop the giant which made them all determined to do it, as she created a sleeping drug that they needed to get into the monster, as she gave everyone a canister in hopes that someone would get one inside the giant. As the students made their traps on the ground, Gigantamachia came closer and closer to the spot that they needed him at until he was on point, and suddenly came dropping down quickly, since they had made the ground like quicksand which sucked him down into it. The league members on his back were all shocked, and even Izuku was shocked to see Gigantamachia drop down so easily. Who the hell dropped Gigantamachia so easily? Izuku thought as he looked over and was shocked to see a lot of people from 1 and 1B. Are they shitting me? Are they really going to challenge Gigantamachia Izuku thought with a laugh at what he was seeing which made the league look and saw what he saw. Your former classmates are quite determined, Mr. Compress said, which got a nod from Izuku as he said they indeed were, but it was foolish, since this wouldn't stop Gigantamachia for long. As some tried to help hold Gigantamachia down, others with more direct combat tied to attack the league which was foolish as they easily repelled the attacks. Izuku stood up and pulled his arm back as he charged 15% in one for all, and slammed it forward with the full cowl on. He knocked those like a Jiro and the others off Gigantamachia and back to the ground. Foolish. You need a far better plan if you wish to challenge us. Izuku yelled out as he glared at them as he needed to act his part. Though they all g to hit with some discs that Izuku realized what they were as Kaminari was about to shock them all, though Mr. Compress dealt with him as he threw rubble in his path knocking him away. Izuku turned and saw Gigantamachia blow a large breath of compressed air that knocked everyone in front of him away as they tried to throw something in the giant's mouth. I see. They were planning to put him to sleep, but sadly that won't easily work with all of his quirks. Izuku thought as Dobby threw some fire to block the students from attacking. We need to keep moving Gigantamachia. Izuku said, but then suddenly explosions went off as Gigantamachia fell deeper into the ground once again. Well they really planned this out quite a lot. Izuku said with a smirk on his face as he was proud of his former classmates. Gigantamachia could dig through the ground right? Spinner asked and Mr. Compress pointed out that it was a direct way to kill them, but he wouldn't since he was ordered to bring them along, which means Gigantamachia was being held back due to them being with him. Indeed he is I might have to use more power or they might get questions about me. Izuku thought, but then suddenly Mount Lady jumped on Gigantamachia and opened his mouth wide. What? Izuku and the other said as they didn't think she would do that. In those few seconds, Izuku saw Shido from his class come through the fire in acid, well that is new must have learned that while I was away. Izuku thought as he punched a pro hero that had gotten on Gigantamachia back with them as the others fought other pro heroes. Though, as Ishido was coming in the air, Gigantamachia decided enough was enough as he said, shortest route means keeping Nats from getting up again. Which meant he was going to kill Ishido and likely Mount Lady as well. Izuku decided to take a bit of action as he threw some pro heroes off Gigantamachia back. He grabbed Mount Lady with some black whips and threw her off before Gigantamachia could grab her, but he couldn't do anything about Ashido, which pissed him off since Gigantamachia's hand went straight for her and it would expose him if he tried to save her. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Izuku thought as he knew she was likely to die. As Gigantamachia's hand came down, Red Riot Akakurshimiya pushed her out of the way and took the hit, while Mount Lady did get smacked by Gigantamachia's backhand, which knocked her out from what Izuku could see, but didn't kill her. Way to go Red Riot. Izuku thought as he could see a 1B student grab Ashido. 
began to match you now standing up and placing the league and Izuku on his back again, was ready to start moving again, when Red Riot was charging his way up the arm of the giant. Izuku saw Kurashimiya throw a vial of the drug, but Toga broke it with one knife, but he had another one which Izuku pretend to try and stop, as he sent a black whip at it, but missed by a small margin, as it went right into Gigantamachi's mouth. Way to go Red Riot. Izuku thought as he cursed out loud. That isn't going to affect the big man is it? Izuku asked as he saw the vial go into the giant's mouth, but no one knew as they said they didn't know. Izuku though while talking had used the black whip that had missed the vial to attack Red Riot as he grabbed him and threw him in the direction that Tokich was in, though Izuku made it look like he went for the kill, as he did put some force into the throw that knocked them both towards the ground but not enough that Tokich didn't recover from. This is annoying now, we need to, Izuku was starting, but got cut off as explosions happened against Gigantamachi's front side. Everyone looked and saw artillery pieces on the ground. Are you fucking kidding me, when could she make things such as that since it should have destroyed her fat reserves? Izuku yelled out as he was actually shocked seeing three big ass guns shooting the Gantamachia from the ground. Your former class is far too much at doing the plus ultra work. Dobby yelled out as he prepared to shot fire out towards the pro heroes that arrived. Indeed they are a bit too plus ultra right now, as they are delaying us too long. Time to end this. Izuku said, and no one liked the tone he took as he down on the ground, Kreidi saw what Izuku Midoriya was doing and felt dread, as she told the pro heroes to dodge his attack, which they did just in the nick of time, as the blast carved up the ground, but still sent them flying in the air. Gigantamachia. Get us out of here now. Izuku Midoriya yelled, and the giant followed what Izuku said as he yelled out and changed a bit, as his claws expanded and tore up the ground, and anyone standing in his way as he charged forward completely ignoring the students from Yue. Back in the distance part of Jaku City, the doctor was yelling out how the heroes would lose. Don't you see with Shigaraki's awaking, it changed everything. The Gandamachia is a calamity who lives and dies for his master's sake, the Nomus were created in his image, and then you full of heroes pushed one of the only people, Izuku Midoriya away from heroics into the new king's hands. If you had Izuku Midoriya then you might have won this war, but you don't since you forced him to join Shigaraki which even all for one was incapable of doing, but thanks to you heroes we win. The doctor yelled out as he laughed. Present Mick only stared at the doctor in shock, as he heard the doctor say that Izuku Midoriya was one of the only people that were capable of turning the tide of the war, but they had pushed him away. What have we done? Present Mick wondered if the enemy considered their former student, even though Present Mick thought he was being forced, was considered that highly by the enemy. Izuku sat down on Gigantamachi's back as he rubbed his muscles as he had put a bit more power into that punch that carved up the ground. Did you overdo it with that punch? Twice asked who had regained his senses a bit from all of the wounds as Toga had patched him up somewhat, but he still wasn't combat capable any time soon. Izuku nodded his head, indeed, even though I've pushed my limits more and more, it still stresses my body out at the upper limits, since I haven't used it much in battle, and just overall to the point my body can withstand it easily. We needed to get out of there so it was worth the stress on my body doing such a powerful punch. Izuku said as he relaxed on Gigantamachi's back and looked at all of them. Dabi was doing something with Skeptic which Izuku couldn't hear about since they were a bit further away, but Izuku didn't think much of it. Though Izuku did look at Toga who wore an unusual expression on her face. Izuku asked her what was wrong because he had to admit he genuinely had cared for them, even though they may hate him when they learn the truth, but that didn't mean Izuku would stop caring for them. He also refused to kill any of them unless he had zero options. Toga turned to her and asked him if they didn't have a right to live, due to how they were which stunned Izuku for a bit, but he shook his head and spoke, it's not that we don't have a right to live this society needs to change since it created this mess. Each of us in the league, though I don't know about Dobby, comes from backgrounds filled with pain and suffering, because we didn't fit society's normal standards, even though quirks are abnormal to start with. Humans had lived for so long without quirks, but in the last hundred years or so we have all forgotten about that we have the right to live just like the next person does. Our quirks or former lack of a quirk doesn't define our right to life, but our actions we do define that. Do you understand what I am getting at? Izuku said as he looked at her in the eyes with genuine emotions which she nodded her head at as she believed she understood. Too many people went into heroics for things outside of saving people if they wanted fame, money, or something else, then that is fine, as long as you truly wish to save people above all else, but I know of heroes that don't care about that like Endeavor. Izuku said and Dobby chuckled at the mention of Endeavor which made Izuku raise an eyebrow, but Dobby said he would understand soon why he hatreds Endeavor so much which Izuku just accepted. Not like I can warn the hero side of anything that might happen, I need to maintain my cover, as long as Shigaraki walks free. 
Izuku thought as he continued to rest until Mr. Compress said they were approaching the cities. This caused Yuzuku to stand up and look out, since he wondered if the government was able to clear it all out. Well this is going to be quite destructive, Izuku muttered out as he watched Gigantamachia slammed into the city and start tearing through it without stopping. As they were moving through, Mr. Compress pointed out there was no one in the city from what he could see which Izuku looked around and noticed that was indeed true. Seems like they did indeed get everyone out which is good. Izuku thought. It seems those villain attacks with the chemical weapons were likely staged attacks in preparation for these battles, Izuku said, and Toga asked what he meant. Izuku pulled his phone and showed a news article about chemical attacks by radical groups, aiming to target cities with higher populations with mutation quirks. Based on the news article from last week they cleared out the affected zones without clearing the rest, but it seems they did it to decrease the numbers of people in all of the cities that were around any of the battle sites. Most likely in the event that we were able to break their armies down, as it would give them a buffer before we hit any major cities. They most likely though didn't account for Gigantamachia waking up since he wouldn't move without Shigaraki, though their pre-planning had saved many lives that would have died due to Gigantamachia's rampage. Oh well they are just delaying everything since the moment Gigantamachia's arrive at Shigaraki's location is the moment we turn the war back in our favor. Izuku said as he just held onto Gigantamachia's back as rubble from all of the building flew up and around them. Izuku turned to Skeptic and asked if he had visual on the battle where Shigaraki was at since Izuku knew he wouldn't go down. There are students I believe that are helping Endeavor and the others fight Shigaraki. The Grand Commander is having some trouble due to Eraserhead, who is quite hurt with a damaged leg. It seems a hero is keeping Eraserhead's eyes open via liquids around the eyes from what I can see on the images. Anytime the Grand Commander goes to dust everyone they throw him up in the air. We need to get there. Skeptic said and Izuku nodded his head as he moved back to them to look at the images, while Dobby was laughing which confused him until he saw it. Well you were right Dobby. They are going quite far for a normal plus ultra, what is driving them to do so much more than the normal pro heroes? Izuku wondered out loud as he thought of what would be driving them. Izuku knew they wanted to get him back, but he refused to believe they would try to get him back on a damn battlefield in the middle of a war. Oh well. No matter what it is in they can't win against overwhelming power, Izuku said as he returned to where Toga and Twice were at as Spinner and Mr. Compress were standing in another area. Izuku sat down with Twice and Toga, and just prepared himself mentally, because he was going to be facing off against his former homeroom teacher, and nearly half of his class, since the other half is somewhere near the villa right now. As Izuku prepared himself mentally, we switched back to the fight with Shigaraki, who was getting more and more annoyed at the people he saw as bugs in front of him, since they were putting up so much of a fight against him. As Shigaraki was fighting against all of them his body suddenly started to break apart shocking everyone. Shigaraki was even confused since he shouldn't have a limit to where his body would start breaking down like this, since he had a hyper-regeneration quirk inside of him, so he looked up at the heroes, and asked him what day it was, but none of them answered. It was at this point Shigaraki realized the procedure wasn't fully completed, which meant he was only half backed, and his body had an actual limit on how much power he could use, before it started to break down before the regeneration quirk kicked back in. No matter, I will still win. Shigaraki said as he again went to try to dust everyone by touching the ground, but Gran Torino appeared once again, and kicked him up into the air before backing away, as Shigaraki had repeatedly tried to kill him. Others like Uravity would also use her quirk on him from time to time to keep him in the air even longer, which annoyed Shigaraki as Bakuga would launch it. They had to fight Shigaraki with all of his quirks which was destructive, and a lot of the class and pro heroes had injuries on them due to the fight. As the fight contained, Endeavor was able to get a hold of Shigaraki to the point where he launched a massive attack he called Prominence Burn, which started to burn Shigaraki's body completely, but Shigaraki was able to force Endeavor off after a few moments, as the regeneration quirk barely kept up with the burning fire. Endeavor did get skewed with some of the rivet stab quirks which acted as part of Shigaraki's body. Overall, the regeneration quirk was slowly starting to heal his body, but he still was heavily damaged, due to all of the large attacks he had received from the pro heroes and provisional heroes as well. Shigaraki was getting to a point he was going to be beaten, and the heroes could see it as how heavily damaged, and how the regeneration quirk was slowing down each time. You heroes you think you won? Shigaraki asked and Endeavor who was heavily damaged looked at Shigaraki, and said that he was slowing down, and would be defeated as even more heroes arrived, but Shigaraki just chuckled. I may be near defeat, but you forgot who is on my side, didn't you? Shigaraki said which confused them all until they hear a large roar from the distance. As they turned towards the direction of the sound, they saw it as Gigantamachia had arrived. Gigantamachia called out for his master as he charged forward and Shigaraki chuckled, nice timing Gigantamachia. 
Shigaraki said as everyone was shocked to see the giant arrival. However, they still haven't given up as Shadow Todoroki and Nijire both pushed forward and launched massive attacks on Shigaraki, injuring him even more. Endeavor however yelled for them to run as Gigantamachi arrived and slammed his hand into the mall as he grabbed his master from out of the battle. As Gigantamachi pulled Shigaraki close to him he shrunk down to his smaller form, but not his smallest, as he deactivated what you could call his battle form, where he had his large claws and more spiky back. Even without that form he was still quite massive, and could cause damage to anyone that opposes him, and Izuku with the League would know from the month and a half in the past, that they tried to tame the big guy. Gigantamachia spoke up and asked for Shigaraki to give him an order, since his will was Gigantamachia's command, but sadly for Gigantamachia, he received no order since Shigaraki was out cold, due to the last attack he received, the damage to him just enough to knock him out. This is your biggest chance to win heroes you need to take it, since I have to keep playing my role until Shigaraki is arrested. Izuku thought as he watched Dobby move to the edge, and called out to Endeavor and Shadow Todoroki. Who, there you are. You all look like ants from all three up here, and what do I see? I spy shoot too. Perfect. Dobby said which made Izuku confused on why Dobby would call Todoroki by his first name. Then it suddenly hit Izuku on why Dobby had such a large grudge against Endeavor, and was so stuck on the man while calling Shadow by his first name. Blue fire large grudge against Endeavor Dobby your Izuku thought as he watched Dobby poured something on his hair, which turned it a different color from black. I have a great name so why call me Dobby when it's Tor? Dobby said shocking everyone. Though while this happened, Skeptic had played a video that he hacked into all news channels, which was a video of Toy Todoroki, as he explains his life, as he talked about how he killed over 30 innocent people in cold blood, and what drove him to it. The video was even played in Ray Todoroki's room, who the staff at the mental hospital were unable to stop it from playing in time, as she listened to what her son talked about. The entire country listened to the video that was playing on all news outlets. Back at the battle, Dobby talked about how he was so happy when Endeavor claimed the number one spot, since it provided him a much better way to tear him down, as he could bring everything out in the open, instead of just killing Shadow to Dorky Endeavor had put so much work into. As Dobby talked, he finally reached the climax point in his speech as he said, the past never dies. Which Izuku found so true as even though he was separated from the Kugo and those that harmed him in the past, the memories and scars across his body never go away. They are with him forever as he had to suffer through all of that pain which dulled over time, but never truly died away. The past truly never does die, and it's why society had come to the breaking point right now as those it threw away still remember all of the pain it inflicted on those it had abused. Izuku thought as he rubbed his arms remember his years in middle school, and when he was younger as no one would help him. Well, that explains a lot, Izuku said as he muttered it low, since the others haven't seen him yet, nor did he want to get seen just yet, as Spinner had moved Shigaraki up to Gigantamachi's back, with Izuku looking him over. The others were trying to get Shigaraki to wake up, so he could give Gigantamachi an order, since he was really the one that needed to provide it. Izuku was sure that Gigantamachi might listen to him as well on some small orders like retreating, but Izuku wasn't going to test it out. The reason he believed this was due to how Gigantamachia reacted back during the encounter with the students from UA as the other pro heroes had arrived, since Gigantamachia did react to Izuku's words, but the others seemed to have forgotten about that. As Endeavor tried denying Dobby's claim that he was his son, Dobby just said that the results he had done with their DNA were being released publicly as they spoke, though he was free to do his own DNA test if he wanted which Dobby laughed after seeing it. The video showed online showed how Hawks also tried to kill twice as well as he was crying and running away, which made people shocked to see it. Damn Skeptic and Dobby make a fearsome team when coming up with all of this. Izuku thought as he knew this would be a large shake to society, but in his honest view, it kind of needed to happen, even though this war would shake society. Society has turned a blind eye long enough. Izuku thought. Soon Dobby jumped down and got ready to unleash a large attack when suddenly they were all hit with wires from above them. Izuku and everyone else turned to look into the air and were shocked to see things falling out of the air, but were more shocked to see who was controlling it all. It was none other than Best Genius who had been on recovery this entire time. Switching back for a few moments, we could see Best Genius inside of the cargo plane that he was flying in, as he prepared to jump down with his cargo. We won't let this go according to your will anymore. Best Genius said as he jumped out of the cargo plane. This was how we could now find Gigantamachia and all of the members of the PFL on the battlefield contained due to best genus Quirk, Fiber Master. The heroes were in joy as they now were gaining an advantage once again, as Bakugo spoke out about his mentor from the internship being on such a so-called recovery. However, Dabi wasn't done as he started to burn the fibers, and Izuka looked around. 
I need to start acting or they will know I am holding back. It's time to play my role as best as I can without trying to turn the tide of the war. Izuku thought as he listened to Mr. Compress and Spinner talk. Spinner pointed out that Gigantomachia was panting once he arrived, as his orders had been satisfied, which made him release that Gigantomachia was tired out, and it was how best Genus was holding Gigantomachia right now. Spinner tried to help for Shigaraki to wake up, but he wasn't doing so. Spinner then looked at Izuku who looked back and nodded his head. Time to put more effort in. Izuku said as he stretched his muscles out and best genius realized someone was breaking free outside of Dobby. Who the hell has the strength to break free? Best genius said capturing everyone's attention as they looked over to where he looked, and a lot of them were shocked at who they saw, since they didn't pay close attention when the villains had gotten captured. Now, do you honestly think you can hold me? Izuku asked with a wide grin as he broke out of the fibers startling best genius. Izuku problem, child Midoriya. Was all called out by people that recognized him in shock. Izuku turned towards them and made eye contact with the racer head and then all of the others. Well if it isn't half of my former classmates and teacher. I truly wonder why you struggle so much. Izuku but then everyone was shocked to hear Shigaraki wake up for a split second, as Spinner had bitten him awake long enough that he ordered Gigantomachia to break free. The giant roared out which caused all of the nomus in the area to start coming towards them, as well as other heroes came charging as well. I'll let Gigantomachia play around while I fight some heroes, so I look like I am doing stuff. Izuku thought as he had broken the other league members out of their bounds who went and started to fight other heroes, as Spinner guarded Shigaraki, and twice who was down for the count currently. As the Nomu came closer to best genius while Izuku fought some pro heroes, he tensed up a bit as he heard something uniquely familiar. Power. Yelled out a voice that was none other than Lemulon who had kicked several Nomus in one go as he destroyed their brains. Well, if this isn't a shock. I thought your quirk was still gone unless ah, uh, Iri must have been trained to use her quirk a bit. Izuku said with a smile on his face which others thought was a twisted smile, and probably was but Izuku was happy that Iri had started to get her quirk under control. Izuku suddenly dodged an attack thanks to danger sense, as Bakugo had suddenly attacked him while others from UA like Wana members, helped defend Best Genius who was still containing the Gantamachia. As Best Genius saw Bakugo fighting Izuku Midoriya Aka Qs, he called out to Bakugo and asked if he had a hero name yet. Bakugo smirked as he tried to land an attack on his former classmate and childhood friend, yay, I've been saving it to reveal. God of Explosive Destruction, Dynamite. Bakugo yelled out which Best Genius thought was a dud, and others criticized it. Though no one expected a laugh from Izuku Midoriya. Really Dynamite. Isn't that from our damn childhood when we were like three before you turn your back on me? Izuku said as he charged forward as he felt somewhat annoyed for some reason at that nickname. Indeed it is as it was the one you gave me when we played heroes and villains. Bakugo said and Izuku found out the reason it annoyed him a bit, as it was indeed the name he had given Bakugo, before he turned his back on Izuku at the age of 4, when Izuku's cork didn't come in. I know Nezu, and Gran Torino said they wanted to get me back, but that kind of ticks me off for some reason. Izuku thought as he powered up to 50%, and grabbed Bakugo by his face, as he screamed out towards the racer head. Oh I, sensei. You better catch. Izuku said with a grin on his face as he launched Bakugo forward towards his teacher, who was being supported by others, as he had received some more wounds from Shigaraki, who had tried to attack him before they had arrived. Izuku could see the claw marks on his face from Shigaraki. I'm surprised Sensei was even able to dodge the cork bullet that Shigaraki tried to us from what we saw on the video feed we had. Izuku thought as the man had barely dodged in time earlier in the day. Izuku though did make sure to grab the others that Shigaraki had when he had freed Shigaraki and Spinner without Spinner knowing about it. Can't let him keep those and use them. Izuku thought as he knew he had only one more dose as the others had gotten broken in Shigaraki's pocket due to attacks he got hit with by the heroes. As the fight raged on, there was a sudden turn of events as Gigantomachia was breaking free, and the heroes thought they were screwed, but Endeavor put in everything he had and slammed into the side of Gigantomachia's head, knocking the giant down to the ground once again. My strength Gigantomachia said and Lemelon spoke up at this point. There was a message from the mountain team. They said they didn't notice an effect, but they had given the giant some anesthetic which seems to be kicking in now. Lemelon said shocking everyone. This meant the PFL members were in a much tighter position than they had been from before. Izuku wondered what he should do as he dodged attacks from his classmates who didn't hold back against him even an inch. This needs to come to an end, but I also must maintain my cover. Izuku thought as he wondered how the battle would turn as Eraser had came charging at him, since the man wasn't blocking Shigaraki's quirks anymore since Shigaraki was out cold. 
It's why Izuku has been having a bit of trouble getting to the other members of his group, since Eraser Hat has been blocking his quirks. Really, Sensei? Letting your students come to face me, don't you remember what I did to you once already without a quirk? Izuku said as he charged a man and fought close combat without a quirk, while still dodging the others as best as he could without danger sense. Izuku could see the other league members struggling as Skeptic had already been detained by other heroes, and even more people kept arriving. What shocked Izuku, even more, was that everyone else from his class that had been at the mountain villa, had arrived as well, where they had ended up joining the fight against Izuku himself. Of course I will let them come face you. It's their desire to bring a stop to you so we can help you. You don't have to do this anymore, we are pretty damn sure you were forced to do this as your back was against the wall with everything that happened. Eraser had said and Yuzuku just broke into laughter at that. Oh you don't know how wrong you are. Indeed backs were against the wall, but I've lived my entire life without being helped and having my back against the damn wall due to this society. Also, news flash sensei, I did this willing. Izuku said as he brought his hands together as he clapped, causing a large shockwave as Eraserhead's view got blocked for a split second. This caused some to be hurt like Jiro who had a sensitive hearing or others that just got thrown back due to the sheer power. Some asked how powerful Izuku was, and some from the villa pointed out how he had destroyed a small mountain with a large punch of him, during one of the battles in the villa which shocked everyone. Does that mean he's been toying with us? Asked Mineta which Izuku smirked at. Oh you have no idea. Izuku said with a large grin as he had used the smokescreen court to stop Eraserhead from directly seeing him all of the time, but the class would keep blowing the smoke away. Though he would generate more and use black whips to throw people away from him as he truly was holding back in his attacks, as he didn't want to kill any of them. Then everything changed as Spinner had put the only serving hand on Shigaraki's face, which caused Shigaraki to wake up fully. Oh, seems Shigaraki is awake. Izuku said as he felt Shigaraki wake up. This caused everyone to freeze as Eraser had turned his vision onto Shigaraki as Izuku had escaped towards Shigaraki as well. All of the students from Wano were following him as their teacher prevented Shigaraki from using his quirks. Shigaraki could see how his forces were losing, and saw the state they were all in as Izuku arrived next to him. You need to see if Gigantamachi can get back up else we are set to lose as Eraserhead keeps blocking our quirks, Izuku said, and Shigaraki nodded his head. Shigaraki tried to get Gigantamachi to stand up, but he was completely out of it, which did not mean well for their group. It's time for us to retreat, Shigaraki said as the lead members all got to him, but Wana and the others weren't going to allow it. Izuku could see Gran Torino who stared at Izuku, and they both turned away from each other a few seconds after eye contact. Though, I don't suppose they will let us leave so easy Izuku thought as he saw Kreidi make tools and other things for the others to fight with as Lemulon moved forward. Though things took a turn for Izuku as Shigaraki spoke up and turned slightly towards him. Yay, they aren't going to make it easy, but neither were you going to make it easy for me either were you. Shigaraki said confusing everyone but Izuku and Gran Torino. Nezu though watching back at the command center widened his eyes in fear as the prime minister and the commission president both cursed as they knew Izuku Midoriya had been made in that one moment, but the question was how. Ah when did you? Izuku asked as he turned to stare at Tenko Shimura with a small smile, which still confused everyone on how easy and calmly they were talking about something in front of everyone, but the heroes noticed the confusion on the other villains' faces as well. The moment I woke up fully, I didn't know before now, but I had a quirk put in me that allows the reading of memories, and I used it right when I woke up to get an idea of the situation since I've been asleep, but I looked more into yours. I saw everything. Though it is nice to know how you truly felt. Shigaraki said with a smile on his face. Ah. He truly saw everything then including the fact that I have the last remaining bullet. The question will be who is faster. Izuku thought as both Shigaraki and Ji faced each other. Indeed that is the question Izuku Midoriya Aka Pro Hero Deku. Shigaraki said shocking everyone as both of them went for a punch at each other. That is something we forgot to take into account. Izuku said referencing the mind reading quirk or the possibility of it, as they never thought Shigaraki would gain all for one at the start of the mission anyway, but by the time they found that out it was already too late as Izuku was in too deep. Everyone else though was shocked to hear that Izuku Midoriya was still a pro hero from what their enemy was claiming, though Eraserhead was downright pissed at the implications of what he was thinking happened. I am going to kill that rat. Eraserhead thought as he turned his quirk on to Shigaraki who noticed it. Shigaraki turned to deal with the racer head, but Izuku wasn't having it. Now don't turn your attention away. Izuku said as he grabbed Shigaraki's arm and tossed him into the air where Izuku went following, as he prepared a maximum limit blow, which collided with Shigaraki blow with some of his quirks, as Izuku had thrown him slightly out of his teacher's range. The shockwave was destructive as it shook the ground below. 
the students thought were confused about what the hell was happening, as they were fighting their former classmate just moments ago until Eraser had spoke, clear your minds as there are enemies in front of us. We will deal with whatever bullshit problem child got involved with after this because he is on house arrest until he graduates when I am done with him. Eraser had yelled out in an extremely pissed tone, and the students nodded their heads, as they have never seen their teacher so pissed before, so they were unnerved at the extremely pissed tone he used. Izuku and Shigaraki were both flying through the air exchanging blows left and right, as they were trying to find the opening that would end the battle, because whoever won this fight really won the war, if Shigaraki was able to escape to recover. As such, Izuku knew he needed to somehow bring his opponent to an end. There's no way you will just surrender to me is there Tinko. Izuku asked as they both jumped away from each other after a fierce blow between them. Nah, you know I won't give up that easily. It's not the game over screen yet as I can still win. Shigaraki said with a small smile as he removed the hand that covered his face. Both of them looked at each other in the eyes before charging at each other again. While this went on, the fight down below got fierce as more pro heroes were arriving and started to overpower the remaining PFL members while having to deal with the nomus that had come as Shigaraki's order since he knew he needed to deal with his former teammate who was really a mole in his organization. Do you think you could have truly joined me? Shigaraki asked and Izuku kept fighting while thinking about an answer to that question. Maybe there indeed was a chance I could have if things were slightly different. I have many people I want to protect which includes my former classmates down below, even though they might not accept me back for the harm I caused them. Izuku said as he used black whips to keep Shigaraki from going back down to the ground and dusting everyone who couldn't get into the air on their own powers. What do you think will happen to us if you win? Shigaraki asked Izuku as he used an air blast attack to try to hit Izuku who dodged thanks to danger sense. I don't know but I won't stay silent if they want to execute you all because you don't deserve it. This society is what created us so it wouldn't be right for them to just kill you all off for what it made in the first place. Izuku said as he got close to Shigaraki and landed a kick to his guts, but got hit by Shigaraki's arm as well, which sent them both flying towards the ground at the same time. Both of them stood up and looked at each other, as they both understood that neither of them was going to give up, which meant one of them might end up dead at the other hand. The thing is though, neither surely wanted that as they could see it in the eyes of each other. We truly are similar Izuku Midoriya, Shigaraki said as he wiped the blood away from his mouth, as his body was breaking even more as he was so badly damaged without time to recover, due to only being half-baked in a sense in regards to his body being changed to hold all for one. Indeed we are Tenko Shimura, indeed we are. Crafted by society but in our darkest moment, we were picked up by two polar opposites of people. If All Might didn't decide to change his mind regarding me that day, I likely wouldn't be here anymore, as my will to keep pushing forward was so close to being burned out. Izuku said as he had a sad smile on his face, and Tenko nodded his head. Both of them charged a powerful attack as they knew they needed to end this. Back at the other fight, Endeavor had stood up again and was helping end the fights, as any hero capable, even rescue type heroes, were helping out as they had finally detained the former lead members. Only some nomus were left which they were finishing off when a large blast of shockwaves pushed them all down to the ground. Everyone turned to the source and saw a large cloud of dust was pushed into the air as Eraser had and all of the students from Wano were running off in the direction where the blast happened. Endeavor didn't know what the truth was about Izuku Midoriya, but he did know if he didn't end up fighting Shigaraki when he did they might have likely lost, or Shigaraki would have escaped. As the villains were being put in court cuffs, others started to move towards where the dust cloud happened, since that is where the two S-Ranks villains were at, even if no one knew if Izuku Midoriya was still a villain, since it was unclear. As we move to the dust cloud, we can see Gran Torino blasting past Eraserhead, who wanted to shut the man's cork off, since he didn't want to trust the old man, since he knew something about this entire situation, and decided to never inform him who was the homeroom teacher of Izuku Midoriya. With them arriving they were stunned at what they saw and horrified as well. Shigaraki was laying on the ground with Izuku Midoriya next to him, who had a large wound in the side that was bleeding heavily. Though what caught Gran Torino's attention on the second look was not the wound that was in regeneration on Shigaraki, the capsule stabbed into the chest of Shigaraki. That's a quirk erasing bullet. Gran Torino thought as he moved to Izuku's side and tried to stop the bleeding, but there were without a doubt internal wounds, as well as being covered with wounds across his entire body but the wound on his side was the biggest one. Come on kid. You have done enough so you need to pull through. Gran Torino said as he tried his best to stop the bleeding as Eraserhead and the others arrived. Eraserhead just told his student Kreidi to make medical supplies to help stop the bleeding which she did, and Todoroki moved over and used his fire to seal any of the other wounds that weren't internal wounds that he knew of. 
Soon a helicopter came flying down as Nezu jumped off of it and ran to where they were. Get them both on the helicopter now to get to a hospital. Nezu yelled as EMTs from the helicopter ran over to put them on stretchers. Nezu and Gran Torino both followed onto the helicopter as a racer had wanted to go, but Nezu looked at him. You need to stay with your students and get them out of the conflict zone. There are SITLL some Nomu moving about and the giant to worry if the drugs wear off. Come to the hospital after the students are removed from the field. Nezu said as he closed the door and the helicopter started to lift up. Racerhead was even more pissed, but knew his boss was right. He quickly turned to his students and they all looked at him. Listen up, we are leaving the battlefield right now. There shouldn't be any rescue needing to be done since all cities, but Jakku was clear out before the battles even started. Jakku was already reported to be clear midway through the fight after Shigaraku woke up so we need to leave so we can get answers out of Nezu. Understood Eraser had said and they all nodded their heads as those that could carry others did so as they wanted fucking answers on what was going on. As they left, the news had already been reporting the possibility that Izuku Midoriya was a spy planted in the League of Villains, but it was unconfirmed as the government wasn't answering questions currently. As all of this went on and heroes were searching for any roaming PFL members that had escaped the villa, Izuku was slightly waking up in the helicopter. He turned his head and saw Tenko was in the helicopter as well, and then he searched for others as Gran Torino and Nezu caught his attention. He Izuku said, and they looked at him as they told him to put his mask back on. Izuku smiled softly as he knew it didn't matter anymore as he could sense his body shutting down. Tell tell my mother I love her right. Izuku said through some coughing as they told him he could tell her himself, but he shook his head. Buddy body shutting down. Danger danger sense going off like like crazy about my death. Izuku said as he coughed up blood. The EMTs were trying their best in stabilizing him, but there were so many wounds and internal damage that they couldn't deal with without a hospital. Don't Izuku said as he sucked in a breath and Nezu asked what he meant by don't. Don't don't let them kill kill the, the league society society created society created them due to their actions no longer. No longer is all 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 for one they may may have gone down a dark path, but society pushed pushed them towards it. Izuku said as Nezu said he would try to ensure they didn't receive the death penalty, as he asked Izuku to save his breath, as he put the mask back on his face. Izuku just laid there in silence as Japan was in chaos with all of the information they were gaining. They were told Izuku Midoriya had defeated the leader of the PFL, and the possibility of him having been a mole by the government. Everyone was wanting the truth of what truly happened, and why a child as young as him would have been a mole. The former classmates who were seeing the headlines were shocked and wanted to know as well as they had arrived about an hour or so later at the hospital that Izuku Midoriya and Shigaraki were sent to. Racerhead, All Might, the detective, present Mick, and the students of Wana all arrived in the hospital where they found Nezu standing out of an operating room with Gran Torino. You damn rat better start talking right fucking now. I want the damn truth for once from you. Racerhead yelled out with his cork activated as he stared at Nezu who didn't even flinch. Nezu looked up at Eraserhead and the others who were glaring at him, but all were silent as they wanted an answer. What do you want to know exactly? Nezu said and Gran Torino rolled his eyes. Nezu stop we need to tell them the truth. They deserve to know it before the statements are released. Gran Torino said and Nezu sighed as he nodded his head. At this, All Might spoke up and asked what was the truth, since they knew something was fishy about the charges brought against Izuku Midoriya from roughly the start. Indeed, the charges are keep made up. Izuku Midoriya never betrayed Yue. Nezu said shocking them all as the detective asked how was that true based on the statements Izuku Midoriya gave last time at Yue. Nezu nodded his head and reminded the detective to remember Izuku's statements. Izuku never directly said. He said I agreed to the position I am in since there wasn't really another option. Which was never a confirmation of him being a traitor to Yue. You all just took it as such because we wanted you to take it like that. The questions and answers were more or less prepared beforehand, and the interview rushed so you couldn't disprove him is not the mole. The reason this all happened was for the fact that it was decided to send someone into the League of Villains as a mole to protect Yue and society. Nezu said and everyone was shocked as Eraser had lashed out with his capture gear and grabbed Nezu. Why a student? Why Izuku Midoriya? Eraser had asked as a tear went down his face, due to the sadness of his student having to do such a mission. Nezu was calm though in front of the rage that was being directed at him. Truthfully. Nezu asked and Eraser had said yes in an aggressive tone which Nezu nodded his head at. Simply because he truly was only a step away from becoming a villain. Even sending him on this mission carried the risk of him surely turning on us, but I was betting on his pure determination to be a hero for him not to break and turn on us. Nezu said shocking everyone at what their principal had just said, as All Might asked what Nezu had meant, and Nezu shook his head in disappointment. 
You all really don't see it, do you? Even though you know portions of what he had gone through at the hands of other people in the past due to him being quirkless, Nezu said confusing them all since they knew about his past, but they didn't really grasp what Nezu meant, though Nezu could see some like Hitachi Shinso and Eraserhead had a good idea what he meant. Nezu told them all to join him in the meeting room that was near them, that the doctors have provided him, since Nezu knew they would come, because he wanted to make Tihem realize what society had truly done to Izuku Midoriya, and those from the League of Villains. As they all sat in the meeting room with Nezu at the head of the table, he looked around at each of them to make sure he had their attention. Nezu took a breath in before starting to talk about the life of one Izuku Midoriya. As you all know, Izuku Midoriya was declared quirkless at the age of four, and I am sure you have an idea on how he was treated by the description of what Katsuki Bakugo had told you all. Nezu said and asked them all which they nodded their heads while Bakugo was silent. Nezu noticed that Bakugo was silent but pushed forward. Indeed, at the age of four, he was told to give up his dreams, because he was quirkless. This was also the start of when everyone around his age started to turn their backs on him, due to his lack of quirk. It started out with schoolyard taunts like all innocent things children do, but children are also horrible creatures as they can be truly cruel. As he grew older, dehumanization started to happen as those around him wanted to strip him of his humanity. They started out by providing a new name for him that was a screwed up reading of his name. Deku which meant worthless or wooden doll. Nezu said and Bakugo flinched as Kurshimiya put a hand on his shoulder. With the start of the dehumanization starting others turned their backs even more as they joined in on it. The people responsible for stopping the actions of the other children don't do it or even join in it, as they call him Deku as well reinforcing it in the young child mind that he is worthless. This continues for years as even when he is physically beaten black and blue, he is not provided medical care by the school staff or other adults, as the child hides it from his only parent, the mother. This is due to pure survival skills that the child had gained, as he knows the father left due to him being declared quirkless. One parent is gone, and the one that remains causes unintended damage as well. Moving back towards the child being declared quirkless the mother only apologizes, and nothing more as the child needs reassurance that he has some form of life ahead of him, but never receives this. The mother though loving is unsupportive and unknowing treats the child as less than human as well, though the child never blames the mother. Why blame the mother when the child believes that everything is his fault by the age of 6 or 7 most likely? Also, asking for help from said mother is a dangerous risk in the child's mind, as they had already lost one parent due to them being quirkless, so they don't want to risk pushing the only sources of love away, by adding more stress on the mother's shoulders. You think that is foolish, but in the child's young mind, it is the smartest thing to do and logical as well. The said child knows that the mother is pushed away from others due to keeping the said child, so he keeps his mouth shut, and places a false sense of happiness, and being okay on their face. Said child knows that the story of the father just working overseas to support the family is partially full of lies, as he had accidentally seen the divorce paperwork that shows the father paying child support. Moving forward, the child has been trying to accomplish anything that could help them survive in the world and chose analysis of others and their quirks, but this results in increased ridicule from his peers and other adults. Even though from a younger age the said analysis rivals that of an adult which is a fearsome skill, but in the child's mind, it's just a pathetic hobby due to conditioning that others put him through via physical and mental abuse in the schools. Even though the said child still tries to hold on to the only realistic dream possible for the said child, due to everywhere else having laws or regulations that block the said quirkless child from obtaining a job in any other field, he is still hated for it and beaten. By the time he is in middle school, the child had statically received death threats and suicide baitings nearly every few days of the week, even if others don't know about it. This child's only friend at least in his mind is one of his main tormentors because he knows really nothing else but physical and mental pain from others, so he doesn't know how to react to others showing kindness or care outside of his mother, who is still unsupportive at this point of the childhood dreams. The child knows that his dream is unrealistic for the most part in his mind which results in him not working out or conditioning his body, since he knows it would likely result in more abuse at the hand of others, since it could be perceived as challenging them. This is due to all of the conditions that the schools have done to the child, as they would alter his grades to be lower than court children, since a quirkless child should never be higher than a court child. As such that influences the child's self-worth greatly, and makes them always try to position themselves lower than others out of deep-rooted fear and conditioning of the child. Now, moving forward this treatment keeps going on and one day the child is attacked by a villain, though he is saved by a high-ranking hero. This high-ranking hero is one that has gone routinely on TV and interviews as he claimed that anyone could be a hero, but when the child asked on a rooftop with the hero. 
while the set hero destroys the children's dreams as they tell him to be realistic, as they don't believe a quickless person could ever be a hero, as they then tell the set child to be realistic. They tell him to consider being a police officer or a detective, but unknown to said hero, there are many things blocking that from being possible, even though that said hero should know about that, but they had spent too much time at the top, and never saw the issues at the bottom of society. This said child though stands on the roof, have had their dreams crushed, with only having been suicided baited not even an hour before that moment. Thankfully they didn't consider taking their life, but their self-worth is destroyed even more at this point as they leave, but their mind without them, realizing it takes them to a villain fight like normal to take notes of fighting styles and quirks. This child sees a hostage, and this hostage is one of their main tormentors, which without thinking the boy goes to save the tormentor, even though they have caused the boy so much harm. Hero from before saves both boys, but the boy himself gets shoot out, while the tormentor is praised, even though the other heroes did nothing to help the hostage. Moving a bit after that the tormentor shouts at the boy before leaving, and then the boy ends up meeting the same pro hero from the rooftop. This pro corrects their statement a bit because they believe the boy can be a hero with a quirk, as the boy needed to acquire muscles to activate the new quirk from what the hero said. Unknowingly to the hero, this causes the self-worth of the boy to be damaged a bit more, but some are rebuilt in a twisted way, as their self-worth has now become tied to the quirk. The boy passes the hero's school exam, even though he breaks his bones with the quirk which gets him scolded all of the time by his future homeroom teacher, who tells the boy he can't be a hero as he was which was true in some form, but it also reinforces the fact that the boy is worthless without the quirk being controlled in the boy's mind. Though this was unknown to others since they can't read the boy's mind nor knew the truth of the boy's entire past, even though the pro hero who trained him should have since the said hero knew the boy had been quirkless up to that point. Though the school screws up by allowing the tormentor to be placed near the boy which means the boy undergoes more verbal and physical abuse, but disguised as training in front of the staff and others. This only decreases the boy's self-worth as he believed things would have changed with the quirk now which some did as he did gain some friends, but it does remind him he only has them due to a quirk being in his body at that point unknown to the boy, though is that his actions are what earned him those friends, but the boy doesn't know that due to his twisted mind which was created by society. The boy goes on to live his life at the hero school where they are attacked multiple times by villains, but during all of this, he finally gains control of his quirk without the, the boy gained control of the quirk by going to the mentor's mentor who trained the boy in three days to gain some control of his quirk. This allows events to move forward to the future point as he has more friends and has done amazing feats while destroying his body a bit too much. Though this really happens since the boy has no real self-worth inside of himself due to the actions of society, and if a mentor never picked the boy up the second time the boy may not be alive in the world today, or may have chosen a darker path which would have been deadly for society, due to the boy's skills that rivaled the mind of the principals of the hero's school, people. Nezu said as he finally finished retelling a version of Izuku Midoriya's life, as he then looked at everyone and asked them a simple question. Do you understand now why the boy, Izuku Midoriya was chosen to play the role of the mole? A child beaten down on repeat by society and barely saved, was the perfect person to go play the role of the villain, since his story was quite similar to others that he would join up with. Nezu said and everyone by this point was crying as they had listened to the principal explain everything. It's not like I looked down on the other's students, but they weren't strong enough nor had the perfect background story for the mission. I also already knew he wasn't the mole, so I could trust him to keep quiet if he did decline, but I knew. I knew Izuku Midoriya would accept without much protest, since he wanted to protect Yue and everyone he cares about at the school, even if it cost him his life. I do admit this wasn't meant to happen as the PFL was not a consideration as the Metal Liberation Army wasn't even known to be around when we sent him on his mission. Things happened and even when he confirmed they had no mole in Yue. It was too late to pull him out as his orders had been changed. Izuku Midoriya wasn't allowed to pull out unless he was made or feared he would be directly killed. If we had lost the battle then Izuku Midoriya would have contained to stay with Shigaraki for the rest of his life if he had to, so we could ensure some way to keep a track of Shigaraki and his forces. That is how dedicated to this mission Izuku Midoriya was to ensure you all walked away alive, because let me tell you this, he held back in fighting all of you as he could have killed many, without having any problem which was hard not to do without risking his positin, but he found a way. Nezu said as he looked at them all as they nodded their heads. Nezu told them that they could only wait to see if Izuku Midoriya would walk away alive from his surgery, as Nezu left the room to return to the door of the operation room, which left them all in silence. When Izuku fell back to sleep on the helicopter as they approached the hospital, he was sure he could hear Nezu in Gran Torino, telling him to stay awake, but sadly for him, he was unable to do so as he soon fell into the darkness.
The next time his eyes opened he saw where he was at and realized what it most likely meant. He was standing in front of all of the past users of One for All, which he noticed he was completely there from what he could tell. Ah did I die. Izuku said out loud and they all looked at him with eyes of pity as they were silent and didn't answer the question. The first user stood up and walked to Izuku as he proxed a huge Izuku, which made Izuku break down in tears, as the other users all walked up to him and hugged him. You are not dead, but you aren't alive either. You are currently standing on the border of death and life, as you sustained quite a large amount of wounds during the entire war, but the final wound that Shigaraki gave you dealt significant damage, since some of his decay quirks kicked in on your internal parts, which are preventing your recovery. I am unable to tell you that you will make it even if quirks are used on you, due to the sheer level of damage you received. You are lucky to have hit Shigaraki with the bullet before the damage spread even further. The first user of the quirk set and Izuku nodded his head as they all sat down including Izuku in their seats. Izuku just asked what happens when he dies, since no one would have the quirk anymore. Even though he asked none of them really knew. They had some theories of the quirk going back to All Might, since he was still alive and connected to the quirk, or they would simply vanish away from the mind space, since there would be nothing left anchoring them to the living world for their echoes, which were kept inside of the quirk. It was also possible that they would continue to exist for all eternity, but no one truly knew since they didn't think the quirk would come to an end, until they learned of the fact that the quirk was killing the users. All for one was sitting in jail where he wouldn't be escaping from, and the original quirk itself was destroyed with the doctor having been arrested. As such, there would never be another all for one walking the earth ever again, so one for all's main purpose of being around was now gone. They didn't know what the quirk would even be used for outside of hero work, which any quirk could do that. Izuku just shrugged and decided to relax with everyone in the dreamscape, since there was nothing he could do about his coming death, so he just needed to accept it, even though he had many regrets. Now though outside of the quirk, we could find a doctor exiting the operation room where he found Principal Nezu of UA, and everyone else that had arrived for Izuku Midoriya, which included Inko Midoriya. I need the people in charge of Izuku Midoriya. The doctor asked as he knew Nezu was one individual, but everyone raised their hands even the younger children which he found idiotic. I doubt all of you younger people are in charge of him, the doctor said annoyed. Which caused their hands to drop, but Eraserhead, All Might, Gran Torino, Nezu, and Inko kept their hands up. The doctor asked if they wanted to move to a private room which caused all of the adults to look at Inko. Even the others looked at her in hopes of hearing the results as well which she knew they wanted, to which she said that it was fine in front of everyone, since they care for him. The doctor nodded his head and took a breath of air in as he knew the news would destroy them. There is no easy or soft way to say this, so I will be blunt. As it stands we are unable to repair the damage done to Izuku Midoriya, which means he will die soon. The doctor said shocking everyone as Inko collapsed to her knees in shock as some tears went down her face. All Might helped her up into a chair as the doctor contained. There is damage that appears to be done via Shigaraki's decay quirk, which damaged a lot of his organs, unless all of this could be reversed somehow then he has no chance of surviving. I'm sorry. The doctor said then the room was devastated into Mirio spoke up to Eraserhead and the principal. Sirs what if we ask Yuri to try and use her quirk on him, well Eraserhead turns it off after the damage is undone. She was able to give me my quirk back. Mirio said and everyone had a rise of hope at hearing Mirio say that, but the question was should they subject Yuri to seeing Izuku in the state he was in. Nezu spoke up as he looked at Eraserhead, Azawa, the decision is yours as she is your daughter, but you must consider the risks of it failing which will traumatize her, though I believe she should have the right to decide herself in the end, because if she knew it was an option, then she may question her quirk for the rest of her life, if she had the chance of saving the person she saw as an important individual in her life. Nezu said and Eraserhead nodded his head. Eraserhead said he would go to UA to see if she would be willing to do it, but even if she wasn't she deserved to be at the hospital for his last moments, due to how close she was to him. Nezu told Eraser that a helicopter was on the roof that he could use to get to UA, and back which he accepted and went off. This was how he found himself landing at UA as he went to the staff room to find Yuri with Hound Dog, who had stayed back on the campus, since he ran security operations for the school. Eri saw her father and asked what happened to Mr. Deku which is all we knew she needed to know the truth. Eri, I need you to sit with me as I explain the situation okay? He asked and she nodded her head and sat down next to him on a couch. Eri problem ch, Izuku got hurt. He was hurt really badly. As always said trying to make this as easy as he could for her, but knew it would be near impossible. Eri asked him if he was going to be alright, and Izawa tensed up, but sighed as he shook his head, which made tears come to her eyes. 
As it stands he isn't going to survive based on the words of the doctor, as all was said, which caused her to ask if she could use her quirk, since she was able to give Mirio his quirk back, which is all when nodded his head which made her happy. Iri, that is why I came here. There is the option of you trying to use your quirk, but there is the risk of it falling as well, so I need you to know that even if it fails his death isn't your fault okay. As all was said and she nodded her head, but said she still wanted to save Mr. Deku, as he saved her which he picked her up, and said they needed to head to where he was at then to save him. As Azawa and Yuri got into the helicopter, Azawa texted Nezu to have the medical staff cover as much of Izuku's body as they could, so she wouldn't see it, as they only needed to know when the major wounds killing Izuku were healed, so Azawa could turn her quirk off just in case. Nezu said he would have it prepared before they arrived, so Yuri wouldn't see all of the open wounds and blood. Both Azawa and Yuri spent the time in the air silent as she had her hands tightly on Azawa, who only carefully held her, as he tried to just reassure her via rubbing her back. I hope this works problem child or so help me I will find a court to bring your soul to me, so I can tear it to shreds. Azawa thought as a certain green haired boy in a quirkscape realm, had a shiver go up to his back, as he asked if anyone else felt the cold shiver which they said no. Time passed and the helicopter arrived at the hospital where Izawa escorted Iri to the hospital room where Izuku had been moved to. He moved into a hospital room that had the viewing room that medical students tend to go into, but instead of medical students, it was filled with everyone from 1A, Nezu, Inko, All Might, the detective. Then Gran Torino, while Izawa and Iri were in the operating room after scrubbing in since Izuku still had open surgical cuts that were hidden behind the fabric that the doctors had put up. Okay sweetie, we've been informed of your quirk so we want you to sit on this chair next to his head, so Eraser Head can still see you okay. The doctor said as she showed her the chair next to Izuku's head that they had placed. It would hold her in, but allow her to touch Izuku to use her quirk, while Izawa was on the other side looking at the damage to make sure it got healed, before he turned her quirk off. But if it didn't fully heal then Izuku's chances of living dropped, since the damage might be still too much for them to fix. So Racer had had to be careful to turning her quirk off at the right time, since she wouldn't know when to turn it off, since they weren't going to show her the actual damage, which was horrifying to even Izawa who was an adult. Everyone was silent and waiting as the doctors all positioned themselves at the medical equipment, and said they were ready. The man doctor told Iri she could start when she was ready which made Iri nod her head and activate her quirk before touching Izuku Midoriya. A quirk spread to him, and she slowly undid the damage as she had gotten good at the speed in which she undid things, so she slowly undid it which eraser head could see the damage being undone. You are doing amazing sweetie, as always said as he watched the damage before glancing at her and then back. Eri smiled at the words of what always said, and it continued to move forward, as an entire 10 minutes had passed as she was undoing about half a day's worth of time which she was slowly moving towards. The damage was finally undone and a bit more which was fine, as Iri stopped her quirk herself which surprised them. I didn't feel any more more being reminded beside Mr. Deku's body, which means I need to stop unless I am aiming for something further back. Iri said in her soft voice as she was a bit exhausted from using her quirk for such a period again, as this was only the second longest time she had reminded things outside of small practicing. As always said that was fine as the doctors checked Izuku out and found no damage based on what one's nurse quirk reading was which provided the health of her patients. Overall, everything but his brain was giving on normal readings which the doctors said that Izuku Midoriya might be in a coma state due to the damage as the body was fixed, but the mind wasn't undone since it's really separate and unique from just the body. As Yeri and Izawa moved to the viewing room, everyone coagulated her for the job well done, and she smiled brightly, saying she was going to save Mr. Deku as he did for her, which made people just smile at her with happiness, as Inko hugged her. Though unknown to everyone at that moment, Izuku wasn't in a coma, but inside of his quirk. The past users all realized what happened except Izuku Midoriya, and they realized why he wasn't waking up. It was because Izuku had already accepted his death which was causing his mind to not awaken back to the real world and trapping it inside of one for all. Damn it. Nana thought as she whispered to the first user on a plan that they could try doing via slightly pushing some communication to the eighth user who was still living which would be a struggle but should be possible for them to do if they work hard enough at it. In the real world, All Might and everyone was now standing in the private room where Yuzuku was placed, as the doctors didn't know when he would wake up which sat in the mall, but at least he wasn't at risk of directly dying to his wounds anymore. As such, they could only wait, but other forces were at work to make sure there was a chance of Izuku returning at all, since they knew he needed some convincing before he would return. As All Might stood near Izuku's bed he was sure he was hearing whispers telling him to do things which freaked him out, but then one of the whispers sounded like his dead master Nanashimar. What the hell? 
All Might thought as her voice kept repeating the exact same things to him, so All Might decided to risk looking like an idiot. He looked at everyone as he called out for their attention, everyone at the risk of looking stupid, I need you all to trust me for a bit, okay? All Might said and they all looked confused but nodded their heads as they waited for him to talk again. He looked at Izuku in the bed and then looked back at all of them. I need you all to hold on to each other in some direct skin contact. Just. This please trust me because I may have gone crazy, but if I didn't think I would regret not doing this. All Might said as they looked at him like he indeed had gone crazy, but those that knew the truth of the quirk and how it was sentient in some form, had an idea where he was heading with this. Inko was the first to offer up her hand to All Might, and then her other hand to Izawa. They both grabbed her hands, and everyone did just as did she with even Eri holding on to someone. As they all looked weird out of making a connected semicircle for no apparent reason, All Might leaned over and touched the forehead of Izuku, while he envisioned connecting to one for all inside of Izuku, since he held it before in the past. Everyone was wondering what he was doing, except those that knew the truth of the quirk, until All Might's eye glowed, and Izuku's quirk turned on by itself, though in truth it was the past users turning it on. After a flash of light, they suddenly appeared in a different location no longer holding hands which confused them all. Where the foo fudging are we? The Kugo was yelling but stopped himself from cursing in front of Eri. The Kugo remembered the last time he did that is when Eraserhead, Izuku, and many others threatened to kill him with various means, after Eri was staying at UA for good. Everyone looked around and they could only say it looked like a random alley in some city of Japan, but no one really knew where. As they tried to figure out where they might be and watching out for any possible dangers they started to hear someone walking from one direction of the alleyway they were in. As such, a racer had and a few others who could do better in tight combat spaces, got out in front while everyone was on guard. As the walking got closer and closer racer had yelled out for the individual to identify themselves, but they made no sound. It wasn't until they walked further out of the darkness from the far side of the alley, did someone make a sound, but it wasn't from the other side. No, it was from Gran Torino and All Might who gasped when they saw the figure in front of them. I know where we are now. All Might said as he started to walk forward with Gran Torino following right behind him as people told them to stop. The figure smiled and hugged All Might who walked up to them. Master Nana All Might and Gran Torino said confusing everyone. Nezu then figured out what happened, and he moved forward as well as Nana looked down. I take it we are inside it. Nezu asked and Nana spoke up finally. You are correct principal Nezu. Quick on everything aren't we? Nana said with a small grin on her face. The others in the racer had asked what was going on because even with the racer had and a few others knowing the truth, they had no idea what really was going on. At this point, Nana moved past All Might and looked at everyone as she smiled. She then leaned down to Iri as she kissed her forehead. Thank you for saving number 9, we owe you a lot kid, Nana said before walking back towards All Might, as Eraserhead was stunned at a quick speed, as he didn't see her move to Eri, because in truth the users have far more power in the realm they are at, because they are within one for all itself. In simple terms, you are all inside of Izuku Midoriya quirk, which is called one for all, Nana said, shocking All Might on her telling everyone the truth which she could already hear his thoughts, even though his echo was still in the quirk, while All Might's mind itself was in it as well, which was weird to the users, since they were really hearing double of the echo somewhat. Some people pointed out that Izuku's quirk was called superpower, not one for all, which Nana shook her head. Wrong, his true name is one for all, a superpower was just a cover story to hide the truth that had gone on since the dawn of quirks. Also for that, we must apologize for not taking care of our matters which forced you all into it, we never intended for our responsibility. Our duty to be such a burden to you all but Izuku and All Might have luckily finally ended things for good this time around, so there shouldn't be more issues from us bloodstain war coming back to haunt you anymore. Nana said confusing them all except those that knew the truth of the quirk. All Might just sigh and told everyone the truth of one for all, which shot them all on the fact that Izuku Midoriya had inherited such a legacy. At this Nana spoke up to help explain why Izuku Midoriya took the mission that he did. As you are all aware now, Izuku never betrayed you or any of you as he was on a mission to stop the League of Villains by being a in it. The legacy played a part in the issue as Tamura Shigaraki was my grandson who all for one took in after the death of my family, due to the quirk awaking from my grandson. Izuku saw many reasons why he took the mission, but being the ninth user of the quirk, helped him make the decision as it tied into the remaining associates of All for One, which turned out to be lucky for us, as we learned of my grandson Tenko Shimur, gaining All for One, and the existence of the doctor as well which he alerted Nezu about. Nana said as she explained how One for All played into the part of Izuku accepting the mission which All Might gripped his fists at, since he failed to stop everything all those years ago, which forced his protege to bear such a burden. Nana asked if there were any important questions which Bakugo raised his hand. Where is he? 
Kasuki Bakago asked right out of the gate, and Nana smirked a bit. Ah yes, always the direct one aren't we dynamite? Nana teased his hero name as she raised an eyebrow, but Bakugo just asked again which made others ask as well, but Nana was no longer smiling, instead had a sad smile on her face. He's here, but before you can see him you need to understand some things, Nana said which confused them but also worried them, but Inko walked forward and asked her to explain. Nana nodded her head and explained why they had brought them all to the inside of one for all, and explained the truth of the court to them. Nana looked at Inko and nodded her head as she began to explain why they were all brought inside of one for all, and told the truth of the quirk. Izuku Midoriya most likely one of the best users out of all of us, but Yuri is also the most destroyed of us, Nana said, which none of them liked how she worded that statement. As you are all aware when Nezu gave you a history lesson in regards to the ninth user of our quirk, you learned how much damage society had done to Izuku Midoriya, but that is hearing about it without seeing it as we do. We see the pain he hides, and we see the sadness and destructive thoughts he has about himself. All of his worth had become tied to the quirk due to how this society treated him before he had a quirk, compared to how he has treated afterward, which have put us in this position that we now find ourselves in. Nana said as she explained that Izuku's entire self-worth was tied to the quirk and him now having some form of happiness, due to being quirked instead of quirkless now, which made them all feel a sense of guilt, due to how their society treats people. Though Bakugo and a few others like All Might and Inko had more guilt for their own actions. Bakugo for all of his actions, All Might for destroying a boy's dreams, and then rebuilding them based around a quirk. And Inko for being as unsupportive as she was, and even when he had a quirk as she had wanted to pull him out of UA at a few points due to him getting injured, which was something that would always happen in the hero life. Itachi chooses to ask the next question on what Nana meant by the situation that they were now in which she smiled sadly. As you all know you are inside of One For All, but what you don't know is that this is where the deceased users of One For All come to rest. We are echoes as far as we know and are not truly a soul, or we may be the true souls of the past users. All we know is that Izuku Midoriya is refusing to leave as he has accepted his death, as we did not take into account the possible involvement of Iri when we informed him of his incoming death before Iri undid the damage. As such, even though his body has been healed his mind has refused to leave the realm of the dead where we reside currently, and if he doesn't accept living again, then he will never return with you all to the land of the living. Nana said as she laid out the truth of the situation in how Izuku's entire self-worth was tied to the quirk, and that since he had completed what one for all was meant to do in addition to what he knew of his condition before Iri undid it, he had chosen to accept death, which forced his mind or rather soul, to stay trapped inside of the quirk itself. Everyone was stunned and shocked to learn of this, and asked what they could do to help would she smile, as everyone wanted to know how they could help. She could even sense the feeling of wanting to help that radiated off of those that didn't speak out like Katsuki Bakugo, who wanted to earn Izuku's true forgiveness, since he has realized through Izuku's leaving for all these months, as he was with the villains on the damage he had caused to his former childhood friend. I am glad you wish to help, but I don't know if you will be able to convince him to return, but that is the reason we brought you here. This is your mission as if you wish to regain your friend, then you need to convince him to return to the land of the living, and reject his death. Nana said which they accepted and Bakugo marched forward without even knowing where to go which Nana rolled her eyes at. That kid really needs to learn how to communicate his feelings, better Nana thought as he floated in front of everyone to lead them towards the location they needed to go to. After a few minutes of walking, they arrived at the location which was a bar. My son is in a bar. Inko asked and Nana shrugged. Do remember we are in the land of the dead for past users, which all of us but him are above the drinking age, and in death does it really matter. Nana said as she wanted them all that he might be quite shocked to see them, so she had no idea what he might do or say. Nana opened the door, and they all entered the bar location, which had a lot of games inside as well like chess and billard as well. As you look around you could see the different users of one for all all sitting around or playing a different game or something to pass the time, though they all noticed Nana entering except Izuku who was read a comic book that the first user had willed into existence, since they had some form of control of the quirk space when they wanted to. Izuku did ask them why they had always met him in broken down building areas, or the place with the chairs, which the first user said was for aesthetics of the conversations, because would someone take something serious inside of a bar which Izuku had to agree with, he likely wouldn't have taken much serious, if it did happen in the bar they were in. Everyone that entered was quiet and looked around the room except one individual, and you could guess who that person was. It was none other than Katsuki Bakugo who charged straight for Izuku and slammed his hand right on Izuku's head. Ouch, that hurt. Izuku yelled out as he pulled himself up to see who had done it, but who shocked to see who had done it. What the fool Izuku was about to curse when Bakugo covered his mouth and pointed to the others were Izuku Soyuri. 
Um, how are you all here since you better not have died? Which still wouldn't explain how you got here in particular, since this place is a bit special. Izuku asked not knowing they knew the truth of the quirk. When Izuku's mind caught up to what he was seeing which made him white in his eyes. You how what? Izuku said as he stood up quickly as he was starting to really process all of them being there. Are you all illusions because I feel like the fifth user would pull something like this? Did you Tagoro? Izuku asked as he looked at the man who looked offended at the question as he denied doing it. No, they are not fake Izuku. We brought them here because there have been some changes with your condition. Said a voice that was the first user. Yoichi, what do you mean changes? Izuku asked the man who had sat down on a couch near Izuku. I mean Yuri has healed your body by undoing the damage which Tenko had done to you, but you are refusing to leave since you accepted your death. They are here to convince you to return to the land of the living, since I know you don't believe you should live anymore. Said the first user calling Izuku out on his thoughts. Izuku's face twisted a bit as he looked down in shame, but All Might wasn't having it, as he moved over to Izuku and moved his head up to look him in the eyes. My boy there is nothing to be ashamed of I can understand why you would want to stay after everything you have been through in life, and with you having originally accepted your death before the situation changed. All Might said as he hugged Izuku. Everyone called out and said All Might was right as some said they wanted him to come back with them. As everyone was talking, one individual walked up to him which was none other than Kasuki Bakugo. Kakin Izuku said and Bakugo looked at Izuku and hugged him suddenly. I know I am horrible at being a decent human being, but I am sorry Izuku for everything I did against you. I am sorry for making you think you were ever worthless. You deserve so much better regarding the treatment you received from me and everyone else Izuku. Bakugo said as he used Izuku's former nickname before the nickname Deku came around. Izuku's eyes widened as he never felt like he would ever get to hear an apology from his former childhood friend, nor be called Suku again, since he was always called Deku even at UA. It's been a long time since I heard that nickname and I honestly never thought I would get an apology. I don't know how to feel about it. Izuku said as he had his arms slightly on Bakugo, but it wasn't really a hug. Eraserhead came up next as Bakugo backed away a bit. Eraser had apologized for never reading the signs correctly about Izuku's past with Bakugo, and allowing Izuku to be harmed directly in front of him. Yue failed you, but if you are willing to give us a chance again I really want to teach you once again, Izuku, Eraser had said, and Izuku felt a warmth inside of himself, as he was having emotions he had been faking for a long time. People kept telling him different things that made his mask that he held up for so long start to break apart as tears were going down his face. The last person that came up was Inko Midoriya, who hugged her son while crying as well. I should have said this all those years ago sweetie, you didn't need a court to be a hero, because you were a hero in many ways even without one, but even now you are a hero to so many people that would have died if it wasn't for you taking the mission as you did. You can be a hero, Izuku. Inko said as Izuku felt so much warmth inside of himself as his mother hugged him. My boy, I should never have crushed your dreams as you did. A quirkless person isn't worthless, and I was blind in my words, as there are so many heroes that quirks provide no combat abilities whatsoever, which means they fight quirkless all of the time. You always were a hero my boy and your kindness was one of the things that made you such an amazing one, before you ever received one for all, as you would have done amazing things in this world without it, as long as our foolish society had given you the chance. So my boy, will you return with me and help me change the society we live in to stop the next Tamura Shigaraki from being created? All Might said as he put his hand in front of Izuku who looked at it before looking at the other past users. Izuku felt their desire for him to return not because of one for all, but because he could do so much change just by being who he was, Izuku Midoriya. Izuku raised his hand and took a hold of All Might, which made all of the past users appear behind him in order as they glowed, and a bright light appeared suddenly. Everyone that had gone into one for all found themselves back in the private room. Only seconds have passed. Nezu said as he looked at the clock and knew the time when they had roughly gone in, and not even a full minute had passed. Some students asked if they didn't just imagine all of that which Eraser had said that it would be impossible, since there were so many of them seeing the same thing. As they all stood there, they heard Izuku's heart monitor flatline, which shocked them all as they thought he had chosen to return, but then one for all kicked in as it sent an electrical current through his entire body, making his eyes open, and his heart beat normal again, which shocked them until they heard coughing noises coming from the bed. Izuku. Inko called out as she moved to the bed to help her son who was coughing with his eyes open. Nurses and some doctors ran in since they saw his heart come to a stop, but froze when they saw him awake and leaning against the top of the bed. I need everyone to step out of the room for a moment as we check him over. The doctor said as he cleared the room but allowed Inko Midoriya to stay. 
After about 10 minutes they were all allowed in the room again, as the doctor said that Izuku would be cleared to leave that afternoon, since they see nothing wrong, but wanted him to be watched by a recovery girl if he felt anything wrong, since she was a qualified doctor. Everyone was just in the room in silence as they processed that Izuku was back in the land of the living, until Lieri crawled onto the bed and hugged Izuku, as she called out for him. I am here Eri just as I promised you that I would return though I seem to have made a short stop for a while first, which I am thankful for you all coming to get me back. Izuku said as he hugged Eri tightly. All of them were happy he was back, but Eraser had broke the chatter as he spoke up, problem child you are starting therapy with hound dog when you return to class. Eraser had said with a small glare that didn't really have anything behind it which made Izuku scratch his head. Um about that, Izuku said which confused everyone on what he was talking about. Nezu do I get to keep my full hero license even if I return? Izuku asked shocking everyone that he had a full pro hero license. There isn't anything stopping you from doing so, since the contract for the mission only said you would be given the full hero license once the mission was completed. Nothing said you couldn't continue at UA with everyone else, since you just wouldn't take the full exam in your third year, and can conduct patrols and such when you wish to as you will still be a licensed hero. Nezu said with a grin on his face. Eraser had spoke up and asked what the hell they were talking about which Izuku explained that he made an agreement with the Prime Minister and President of the Commission that ensured several things, with one being he received a full pro hero license. The original mission was nothing like we ended up with, but I didn't know if I would be accepted back in the class after all of this, due to possible resentment that the class may have, even though I held back the entire time, Izuku said which caused Jiro to ask if he was holding back at the villa when he was dealing with them on the giant's back. Ah, you are talking about when I launched that big attack which everyone dodged since I gave them enough time in my charge up when I didn't need to do so, and it was where you all got the drugs into his mouth which good job by the way. Izuku said and asked, and Jiro nodded her head. Izuku smiled at her and nodded his head. Yay, I was holding back even during that time when I launched that attack at the heroes. I use about 70% which I can go up to 80% without support gear. With the gear I had in the war one could do 90% which is far stronger than All Might's Prime 100% by the way. If I directly hit anyone at 60% then there is a good chance of death, which is why I use air pressure a lot of the time like All Might does, since people survive it easier than direct contact. Izuku said with a huge ass grin on his face, which All Might even have a grin on his face at his protege's progress. Some people were saying how having one for all would be amazing which Izuku cut off right away. No, it wouldn't be. Izuku said with determination in his voice shocking everyone but All Might who had an idea on why. So it's true fuck. All Might said and Izuku nodded his head. Yay, the past users confirmed it as they were 100% sure after you dig some digging and compared it to us. One for all I don't know if All for One truly did plan it, or if he just got lucky for such a downside to the court to be present, I think it wasn't intended, since he didn't plan F for One for All's creation to start with. Izuku said as everyone was confused as even Nezu was confused, but knew it wasn't good as All Might had his head in his arms. Please tell me you aren't suffering any effects. You are technically breaking the rule of one for all. All Might asked and Eraser had spoke up and asked what they were talking about as Izuku looked at him and sighed. One for all there is a reason humans can't wield multiple quirks. It kills them which one for all has done to each user, since they were born with a quirk unlike All Might and myself. We can see this in the fourth user who decided to dedicate his life to powering the quirk up, instead of finding all for one, as our quirk started to kill him by destroying his body as he already had a quirk. All Might was fine since he was born quirkless, and All Might I am fine as well, since the other quirks are still connected via one for all itself, which alerted my body to hold them from what I've gathered. However, as the past users told me, I am the last user of one for all, since there likely aren't going to be any more quirkless people being born by the time I would actually pass the quirk on. Izuku said as he explained the situation of the quirk shocking everyone. Izuku explained that if anyone had gained one for all outside of Izuku or another quirkless person, then they would have likely died in a year or two, since the quirk had grown even stronger since the fourth user who had died at age 40 due to the quirk. Soon everything calmed down, but it was also time for the truth of what Izuku was doing to be released, as a press conference was scheduled for that night, since Izuku was cleared to leave the hospital. The government wanted everything out in the open about Izuku's position, so people would be clear about what he was doing. This was how Izuku found himself sitting on a stage answering questions to reporters who wanted to know everything that went on. Some asked why he was chosen which Izuku decided to use that as a chance to start reforming society. You ask why me? Well, because my life was one that was similar to most of the villains in the League of Villains. I was beaten down by this fairy society that led to the creation of the League of Villains. 
Izuku said right out of the gate shocking everyone even those on the stage. Some reporters tried to bait Izuku as they asked if he was blaming the public for the actions of the villains. No, I am blaming the public for the why it happened, not the how it happened which is two different things. The how it happened is clear, a group of people rejected by society got together, since they had enough of being treated like they were which lead to them gaining power and the destruction that happened. The why though is due to society, and I will explain why. Izuku said as he went through some of the lives of the league members like Toga and Tenko. He even talked about his one persona life himself and how he was treated when he was corkless. As long as our society acts the way it does then this will keep going on. There will be another Dika city, another Jaku city, another Kamino ward incident until it boils over to be too much, and everything just breaks apart with no government or anything that remains. Our society's current values have to lead to the creation of the Meta Liberation Army once again, and the League of Villains or any of these other organizations. Am I saying all villains are like Tenko or Toga? No, since there are indeed those that just want to cause harm and kill, but we had those before Quarks came around as well, now didn't we? No, what I am saying that our current society needs to change how we are acting, because when did it become so important for a job, that you must have a certain type of court to work in a normal office, when it had no real benefit for the set job? Why have we looked past experience and expertise in things when quirks don't make a difference for those things? There is no such thing as a villainous quirk, weak quirk, useless quirk, or anything bad about being quirkless. The human race was quirkless for so long before quirks came around, but then we slowed down technological advancements because we became so consumed with quirks. So as I look at our current society I do indeed blame it for why all of this happened, and I won't regret calling our society out on that. Did you all know that All Might was quirkless for most of his early life, before his quirk appeared similar to me? Just think about the treatment I went through and he did do to our society, and the fact that if our willpower was even slightly less than it was, we could have turned our backs against it like so many others. Izuku said revealing All Might's past of being quirkless since he had talked to All Might before the conference had started, since the man wanted to help change society. As such, they needed a big reveal to make an impact. Izuku answered more questions and defended his position for why all of this happened, while accepting the reason on how it happened, because indeed it all happened due to the villains, but the reason for it to have happened in the first place was society itself that caused it. This went on for over an hour until it came to an end as Izuku had even hit upon Endeavor, as some asked if he should remain a hero which Izuku said that it should be up to the Todoroki family to decide it be, because it was different from the man staying as the number one pro hero and a hero altogether. Izuku soon sat on a couch in Yue's staff room and relaxed as he took a breather from so much talking. Nezu entered the room with a card in his hand which Izuku believed he knew what it was and was correct. It was his pro hero license. I thought I would come to hate my hero name, but it still comes off as I can do it as it was changed by those that never gave up on me at this school, Izuku said with a smile, and Nezu nodded his head. Nezu asked if Izuku was ready to return to the dorms, since they never removed his things from it, even though they said they had to the students. Izuku nodded his head and headed off to the dorms to greet everyone where they all welcomed him. I'm back. Izuku called out and they welcomed him back. One year later. Walking through Teridus which was the securest prison in Japan, we could find one Izuku Midoriya who had gotten permission to enter the prison to see several individuals. Izuku was sitting in an open room that didn't have a guard window or anything, as he didn't want one for the people he was going to be meeting. The door across the hall entered and in came all of the members that belonged to the League of Villains. Some looked at him and turned their heads slightly, while others greeted Izuku, and he greeted them back. Hello everyone, it's been a bit. Sorry I couldn't come sooner since there was a bit of chaos to be dealt with after everything and some things I had dug up for society to deal with. Izuku said and Tenko sat down and looked at Izuku. Dabi was the first to speak up as he asked Izuku if he thought they would ever forgive him for his betrayal. Izuku shook his head, I don't know if you ever will, but I must say I still see you all as my friends, even if you don't see me as such. Izuku said as he pulled a deck of cards out and asked if they wanted to play a game as they talked which they agreed as Tenko said he would, which caused the others to agree to it, since it was better than going back to their individual cells. Tenko was more or less silent, but would look at Izuku every so often with a look in his eyes that Izuku recognizes. It was a look of questions and analysis that Izuku would have when he questioned people about quirks. He said things were a bit chaotic, was that due to the war? Tenko finally asked and Izuku nodded his head but added onto it. Indeed but other things as well. I told the stories of your lives and made society face the fact that even though you were the how the war happened the way it happened was society's fault which caused quite a bit of issue that I had to deal with as I got pulled into meetings with the government and everything as I explained my viewpoints. 
Izuku said shocking them all as it caught their attention on what he was talking about, and they sat up straighter more now. Izuku and they played a few hands before Izuku spoke again, society is starting to change as laws are being changed due to the war and everything that came to light. Anti-discrimination laws, quirkless rights, changes to hero laws, changes to the hero system to hold them more accountable. Fewer restrictions on quirk usage as people can obtaining licenses easier to use quirk in daily life, and self-defense as well. A lot of heroes ended up quitting as I called a lot of them out on why they joined the hero system in the first place, because if their main goal isn't to save, then they shouldn't be in it, which caused a shortage in heroes. There was some rise in crime that I had to deal with, but luckily I had my old class helping me and a lot of less known heroes that truly wanted to save people became far more dedicated as the fakes left the stage, but it is still a work in progress as things change and new laws happen. Izuku said as he won the first round of their game. Dabi asked what happened to Endeavor and Izuku looked at him before speaking, he was removed from the number one spot and is currently leave pending a decision by your entire family which includes you. The family can decide if he is allowed to continue being a hero without ever being ranked again and restrictions placed on him or have his license removed for good. There is also the option of you pressing charges for any crime he committed against you in the past which is in this file. There's some notes from your family as well that they want you to read before you decide anything. I will take whatever decision you make back to your family and government. Izuku said as he gave Dobby the file as Izuku had asked him how he wanted to be called moving forward, and he said Dobby still which Izuku respected. After a while, Dobby returned and gave the folder back with his decision inside. Dobby told Izuku he could look if he wanted to, but Izuku said he would only look if Dobby wanted him to see it, otherwise he would just deliver it to his family and the government without seeing it. Dobby said it was okay so Izuku looked, and he saw that Dobby choose to not press charges, but voted against Endeavor getting his license back which Izuku suspected to happen, but what he didn't see coming, was that Dobby made an option that would require Endeavor to be a sidekick for the rest of his life, which Izuku found funny as hell. Izuku ended up laughing, and Dobby smirked as he knew what Izuku saw. That is an option that wasn't thought of and might work out as a good one, Izuku said with a smile on his face. Another game had started as Dobby had rejoined them when Izuku presented another folder to each of them which they opened and started to read. Eyes widen and Tenko raised up to look at Izuku with his mouth open. Inside the files were their sentences for their crimes that Izuku fought for them in court. They would not be executed, and they would not be spending their entire lives in prison either. They each would spend about 10 years give or take for each individual in prison, with an option for rehabilitation programs starting year 5, which Izuku was sure they would likely qualify for as Izuku had argued how society's actions influenced them all into what they did. Some like twice would have mental health support to help with his issues as well, to ensure he would be ready to rejoin society. I told you Tenko I wasn't going to let them kill you. I am also starting some outreach programs to help prevent the Tamura Shigaraki or the next Dobby or the next twice and so on from being created by this society. Not when someone can offer a hand to them to help them to a brighter future. Heroes can't save everyone, but I'm not trying to I am trying to save as many as I can and have others help me catch the others that I miss. I would be honored if you all would join my organization when you leave prison in the future. Izuku said as he had offered them all a job. Toga asked how he would afford such a program and Izuku smiled, well, I am not the number 8 pro hero for nothing, since I have my full hero license per agreement when I took the mission to spy on the league. My actions in becoming a spy to help protect my friends and then calling society out for all the shit they pulled earned me quite a lot of public support from mutation type quirks, so called villainous quirks, weaker quirks, or anyone that remains quirkless throughout the generations. I just ranked it in the recent polling due to all the actions I have been doing, and I'm likely to increase in ranks the more I do as I expand my influence to change society. So want to join me? Izuku asked with a smile on his face as he won the game again, and twice threw his cards into Izuku's face, which caused him to laugh. Tenko smiled and said he would love to join as the others nodded their heads. They had a grudge against Izuku, but him showing the changes he was making to correct the wrongs that had happened against them, made them realize he truly did care for them as Tenko had said in the final fight. Though Toga did ask how his classmates felt about him calling a group of villains his friends which Izuku broke out into laughter. Ah, some of them wanted to come with me, but I only had permission for myself this time around. They all found out about my past which helped them understand you guys a bit better so most have some discomfort, but they don't hate me for it. I think they would warm up to you guys pretty damn quickly. A lot of the discomfort comes from the previous attempts attacks the league did, but as I said, I think everyone could get along as some of them will be joining my organization to help spread it as a few had what people called villainous quirks, so they had some similar past to us. 
Izuku explained, and Toga smiled in the joy of making new friends, if they truly could get over their fears of them having been villains. This was how Izuku spent the past year before coming to the prison to see everyone, as he fought for the change to start happening in their current society, and had skyrocketed up into the ranks, due to the support from the groups he was fighting for. They believed in the changes he would bring and not forget about them, as the previous society and system had done under All Might, who had publicly apologized for not realizing how screwed up the society was under his watch, though no one really blamed him he still felt guilty. He also announced how he was supporting Izuku's organization he made as Izuku had taken control of Might Tower, which would be helping the finances of the group view All Might, as he wanted to help save those he had originally forgotten about. Izuku knew that the changes would be hard to make as quickly as he would want, and society would resist in some of it, but he knew it could be done. Izuku had been enjoying his time at Yue as well, where he spent portions of his time with the class, as he would do patrols and other things mostly after school. There was some tension between the class for the first few weeks before they all had some group therapy with Hound Dog, to help understand their emotions, and overcome the fears they faced, since some had fear due to the overwhelming power that Izuku had used in the war, that was directed at them for a bit, but things did work out which he was glad about as they had apologized to him, but he was fine. With it as he needed therapy as well for all of the death he witnessed. This is the story of Izuku Midori of the pro hero Deku who had played a critical role in the war for modern day Japan, as he would later go on to advocate for even more change as the years went on, and rose to the position of number one pro hero. He became known as one of the greatest heroes to ever live, due to his accomplishments in changing society for the better, which decreased crime rates across the country, since he did it via advocating for changes, instead of just forcing his way through fights all of the time like heroes of the past, but was willing to do so when needed. This concludes this what if series. If you enjoyed the video leave a like and subscribe with post notifications. So you'd be notified when the next what if release. Until next time.